Videos recording, audio is recording. You can sit like in that queen poster where the two bottom and one at the top. <laughs> you can sing Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. <laughs> I love that. That would be awesome. You should do that. Well, um, le- so- let alone that there was a philosopher Kant. Oh, um, yeah. uh, you know, the. Uh, Marx took half of his stole half of his philosophy from Kant, half from Hegel. So, Kant, I, we have to be grateful to Kant for Marxism. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. Kantianism is that fundamental idea that that your intent matters with regard to the eth- to the ethics of the outcome, right? Is that the basic gist of Kant? Yeah, and that, you know, people think in categories and, uh, yeah, the whole th- theory of thinking, basically Marx uh, took the idea that the mind is a social construct. And that idea actually then got uh, implemented in the propaganda theory, which is uh, the topic of our discussion today. So awesome. that leads us to, <laughs> to agitprop. Yeah, so Marty, one thing, and forgive me, I haven't have been so busy. Oh no, what is agitprop? Perfect. Yeah, because very huh. few people have, I didn't actually know the word agitprop before I met Oleg. Um, actually, so. you have a bunch of my posters here on this. <laughs> these are these are a bunch of yours. I'll tell you which ones. Um, I bet the bottom right. Um, that, that sure looks like well, something. the one with Michelle Obama in the very middle. This one? Yeah. <laughs> then the next one is uh, spread your wealth around. There are two of them, Obama pointing the finger. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the two pictures, I don't know if that's the original, because I, I took the original Soviet poster. And then the, um, the work uh, breaking the chains. I used it in my work, but it's it's not my version. It's the original version, I think. Let me look at this. Uh... I'm just going to, from time to time, I'll look, I will share my screen. Mm-hmm. If we're talking about something that's relative and I can pull it up, I'll pull it up while we're talking about it. That way our viewers can get a little better idea of what we're talking about. You know, one thing that we might want to do, and Oleg is probably thinking... This all <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> um, the uh, we might want to give the devil his due with regard to Antifa because Antifa uses agitprop very, um, very effectively. Well, and that's what I want to point out too is, and especially you know here in America is is to get our listeners to recognize when they're when they're being fed agitprop, you know, Michael yeah. Moore, he's a huge agitprop douchebag. Yeah. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen, huge, oh. you know, agitprop. Uh, That's so sad. He's so talented, but at the same time, he's such an asshole. Right. <laughs> exactly. So more examples like that, that we can come up with and we can point out to our listeners is like, all right, you know, you're watching this, you're seeing this. Well, this is, this is basically, you know, agitation propaganda. At its finest. That's yeah. why I stopped watching American movies because you, bear, you, you can't find anything in Hollywood these days coming out of Hollywood that doesn't it's all have. Politically it. motivated, yeah. It's, uh, it's so right. disappointing. We'll go ahead. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I haven't heard from Bandito. I have a whole collection of anti American Soviet posters. Um, and maybe um, I, I was thinking about making a separate book with it, you know, a book about propaganda and illustrating it with those posters. Oh, there, okay. is, there are so many and they're so evil and so vicious and so unfair. <laughs> I had to look up some words too. Uh, bourgeois. Bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marx used it uh, a lot. That's basically capitalist, like petty capitalist, petty bourgeois. That's like uh, the level of uh, shopkeeper. Yeah. Um, then there's big bourgeois. They're like capitalists, uh, like tycoons. Yeah. 
bourgeoisie is the capitalist class. <clears throat> Oleg, is there anything in particular from our conversations that you don't want brought up? Like my recollection from our earliest introductions, maybe from Father George or from you, was that you know you'd done agitprop in in Soviet Russia, never got arrested, but um, were warned to leave. You took the invitation to leave. You got here, and that you've been arrested twice, which I take as a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. You can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, no, it, I was arrested once here for uh, political, you know, for putting up uh, anti-jihad posters, like pro-Israel posters, on a uh, campus at uh, George Mason University. That's excellent. The reason I ask is that um, there are some people who are who are, uh, to be blunt, not very smart. And what we want to do is is make it abundantly clear that you are a freedom freedom loving American um, who began life in Russia, uh, but but and that um, political oppression here is a very real thing. And so you know it, it, that'll be you know part of the. We can weave that in as we go here. I'm sure it'll happen naturally because you can't avoid it. But I just wanted to make sure I wasn't saying anything you didn't want said there. And again, All right, I'm going to grab my drink uh, and then I'll come back and we'll get started. Does that sound like a winner? Excellent. Right. Yep. Little pineapple claw, baby. Did you pour one for me or? Oh, I do have whiskey and stuff if you guys want to. I'll. I'll yeah. It's like, you even got to ask? Come on, yeah. man. Because I, oh, I like, know what whiskey he's got. I just, drove, I just drove 40 hours. Like, I'll take a whiskey. Yeah, that should have been like the <laughs> first thing he offered you when you <laughs> landed, man. No, the first thing he offered me was a mill. Yeah. Gotta get, a <laughs> first while to get going. Yeah, it is. Put you to work, son. That's good stuff. Hey. So this is... Uh, a brand that Jeff Kirkham turned me on to, Basil Hayden. It is legit. That sounds uh, bourgeois. It's <laughs> <bourgeois. Yeah. laughs> so What is it? Uh, whiskey or brandy or? It's a uh, bourbon. Bourbon. Okay. Kentucky bourbon. Yep. Yeah. Marty says the guy with a the thermal scope just you know sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> Bougie AF. <laughs> I'm badass bourgeois, though. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> oh, speaking of, Brian. Um... I'll show you a fine bottle of vodka. Hold on. There we go. Oh, yeah. Now now we're talking. Now we're talking the talking lead show here. There it is. Fins and liquor. Hey, guys. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And it says uh, for, for uh, was it? Mm, service to the motherland and, yeah. and then you go like this <laughs> and, it's, and it's a bottle of a bottle of vodka nice yeah. is that uh is that mikhail kalashnikovs uh, i don't know uh you tell me i don't know much about guns so you tell me what model it is well i mean that's not one of his but he does have a or he did have a liquor company a vodka company and they, oh yeah, uh, he made glass. Uh, he made bottles yeah. in the shape of uh, that uh, rifle, made of glass. I saw those pictures. That that rifle, the AK forty seven, baby. Yes. <laughs> we are we are the AK corner. That's that's the title of this show, Oleg. In case you didn't know. Yeah. This is the talking lead AK corner. <laughs> oh. Took a little sip. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey, that's how we get tuned up on this show, brother. That's a, that's a, <laughs> I love it. That's perfect. If you're ever going to put a gun to your mouth, that's the perfect way to do it. Yeah. Uh, the only way. <laughs> the only time you put a gun to your mouth is with this bottle. <laughs> when it's full of vodka. I love that. Yeah. All right, let's get started. I guess the bandito will join us uh, momentarily. Uh, so we started, we've been talking, uh, guys, appreciate uh, everybody tuning in to another episode of the Talking Lead AK Corner. This is episode eight. If you didn't get an opportunity, make sure you go back to last month's episode where Brian, we talked about trench art. That's correct. 
Did which you forget? Directly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I had to, it's been a busy month. That seems like six years ago. Um, you guys, it seems like yeah. just like just me. <laughs> seems like we just seems recorded like we just that, episode. that episode. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It was a great episode, and, and it overlaps with the topic for today, and really, it's almost like we planned it. Well, we kind of well, did. I'm getting some feedback <laughs> from you. From us now? Yeah, getting feedback from y'all. So Brian is in a, in an open room. He's got a couple of guests. We're going to have him introduce those to those uh, who can't see or listening uh, on the audio only. Uh, we do do a video version of this show now. You can go to YouTube and catch it. Uh, try to put one out every month uh, along with our normal podcast so you guys can go and actually see the beautiful people that we're talking to. And um, right, so last episode was trench art. And that kind of what is what led to this month's show because we got into talking about um, some of the agiprop and the artwork that was behind that. And I was like, hey, that would be a great show to do in and of itself. So um, here we are today, and we've got, again, my consummate co-host, Brian Keeney with Occam Defense Solutions joining Ab us. Absolutely stoked to be here again with um, somebody who's turned into a, a really good friend and very excited to be getting the deep dive on his story. And I'm going to let you do the honors of introducing our most esteemed guest. Yeah, so, so I've had uh, Oleg Adbashian through a mutual friend um, in 2018, something like that. And um, he was told that he's a great artist, but also a, uh, a Russian-born uh, refugee uh, who uh, had made it to, to liberty here and did really great work, but was also a conservative. And uh, so wonderful to line up with artists to share our values. And he did some really great um, posters for us that most folks have probably seen that are these propaganda posters from Soviet Russia um, that he adapted for our works. Um, and so very pleased to have Oleg on the show today. And he also did this artwork. That's correct. He had, it, yep, yep. And yeah. he's done some work for some other of our friends as well. And um, he does um, fine art and also graphic design and um, also really good um, conservative commentary on the people's cube and has a couple books out about his his uh, trek to liberty oleg welcome in thanks for joining us thank you hello comrades <laughs> glad to be here how do you say hello in russian uh привет it is more like inf uh, informal hi привет 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 Yes. Previous. There we go. I was trying to figure out, I always say Das Vidani, but I think that means bye, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that means, yeah, until yeah. until I see you again. Gotcha, gotcha. So, Oleg, we're stoked to have you on the show. Uh, I know you're going to bring a lot of education. We call it lead education here on Talking Lead uh, to our listeners on uh, the subject of agiprop. So we're looking forward to that. Also joining us this episode uh, we've got a newbie another newbie joining us and uh, it's for you listeners who, who follow him which I know a lot of our listeners do follow you it's Bandito Bill Bandito hey guys how are you doing great man welcome. welcome in hey it's a pleasure being here and thank you for having me absolutely so I don't know how he is on your screen but above you is Brian Keeney with Occam Defense and and his crew hey oh, over to the other side there, we've got Oleg at Bastion. Mm -hmm. How are you, sir? Uh, and then, Bandito, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, so, you know, like it was stated, I'm an AK enthusiast, an, an overall firearms enthusiast. Um, you know, uh, on, now, nowadays, sorry. Uh, I'm also the owner of SureShot USA, as well as Illinois Precision Machining. Uh, so we manufacture uh, basically a free flow AK chassis system. Very cool. Very cool. So you know a thing or two about the AK-47? Uh, a few things. A um, little bit of family history behind it, too. Yeah. And uh, maybe you can talk about that a little bit uh, as we get into the show. Now, talk about your family background. Myself? Um, so I am Chinese. I was born in communist China. 
uh, you know, spent the first seven years of my childhood there. So, you know, got to experience a lot of the propaganda and such. Yeah. Uh, moved to Canada when I was seven. And then here to the Chicagoland area when I was uh, 14. And been here ever since. Okay. So, you, well, you're about 20 now? Uh, no, I'm 35. <laughs> I'm going to be 36 soon. I'm just teasing. I'm I know. Teasing. I wish. <sighs> we, we do that on this show. So, feel free to it's bust right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we we do that a lot here. So yeah, leadheads. Our topic is agitprop, and we're going to talk about that, what it is, uh, how it's being used in America. But we've got two great examples here of uh, the the beginning of agitprop with Oleg over in Russia, uh, and then of course uh, with Bandito Bill in China, heavily used there as well. Um, but before we do that, Brian, you didn't introduce your guest. Let's let's. Let's hear about your guests you've got with you. Yeah, I've got my two right-hand men with me, or my right, my left-hand man, whatever you want to describe there. But um, Austin Colomayo, I met at uh, Tactical Response Alumni Weekend in 2016, yeah, 2015, like 2016. <laughs> and I had been uh, working on the RST, which was our first product. It's a, a railed uh, rear sight base and um, was looking for... Uh, some help because I had a electronics business I was running on the on the for my full time job and I I didn't understand some finer points of what are called GD and T or global dimensioning and tolerancing that I knew I needed to learn and so uh, had a chat with Austin and uh, we had a really good overlap and we've been working together ever since Austin is one of the co-inventors of the Merc Handguard and um, has done most of the programming and machining for um, for our different products like the stocks, you know, all the parts we make, uh, Austin is the programmer of those now, and um, also develops new tech for us on the production side as well. Uh, Cody came to me in the middle here, Cody Kopp, um, Cody. in 20, 2018? Yeah. yeah, August of 2018. Um, as an intern, he was a physics math major at University of Idaho, which is 300 yards from where we're right now and um driver driver all right the driver you know if you play golf you know it's a dr you know oh oh okay yeah <laughs> no i'm i'm into chicks uh, so, <laughs> um so uh uh the uh, cody started out doing electronics with me and when we had a, a decision point to make about what business to move forward um uh, my wonderful wife said that I should do the defense side because I liked it so much more, which is true. And so Cody moved over and was one of our first builders and has graduated into production design, sort of general management of, of the shop. He's he's the guy most people talk to. Um, he is. Well, he is better looking than you. So <laughs> There's that as well and more polite. And so more uh, yeah, no, we, we're very grateful to have, you know, people love to trash on millennials and Z and and we've got some shining exceptions to that rule um, around here. So very happy to have some young energy and uh, old school work ethic in these two gentlemen. Well, guys, we are glad to have you on the show. Cody Austin, thanks for joining. And uh, uh, I'm excited about this show because um, I, I didn't know about Agiprop. I mean, I knew what I knew of, Agiprop existed, but I didn't know it was called Agiprop. So I think as our listeners start listening as to what it is and the different forms that it takes, they're going to go, oh, okay, that makes sense now. Yep. So, uh, um, the word Agiprop was in talking with Oleg because I, I said, hey, I've got these propaganda posters and I want to do some stuff to him. And he goes, oh, you mean Agiprop? And then I was like, oh, yes, that's the word for the thing that we all know about. But those really striking propaganda posters um, among other things that is kind of the general art form that we're talking about but um, there's a lot more to it than that that uh, and we're just gonna give a, uh, an example I've got a I've got them up here somewhere here they are so this is an example of what agiprop uh, banners look like right agiprop is agitation and propaganda and uh, basically it's uh, the a form of newspeak, as in Orwell's 1984, but Orwell modeled his uh, 
society in 1984 from the Stalinist Soviet Union. And those kind of words, new words in new speak were pretty popular. So they just created new words out of uh, the first syllables. So agitprop is uh, one of the new speak creations. So Very good. And that originated um, was it back proper. in the 1920s? Uh, the word? The uh, word itself. Now, agitprop has probably been around much, much longer than the term was actually coined. But Right. Not in the 20s. I think that right after the revolution in 1917, they started uh, <clears throat> engaging artists and creating uh, visual agitation and propaganda. Not just visual, they also were in, in engaging uh, theater troops to send them to towns and villages to perform agitational uh, plays, just very simplistic, two-dimensional plays where the bourgeoisie were the bad guys, you know, the, the capitalists, and then uh, the uh, proletarians, the working classes were the good guys, and they would uh, kill the bourgeoisie and take away their property, and that was a good thing. So th those were <laughs> very simple. That was also edit prop. So there are many. It takes many forms. Right. We'll we'll talk about that as we uh, get involved with it. Uh, now, Bill, you said you're from originally from China. You're obviously your your family, your first mm -hmm. generation, I guess, to come over to America. Yes. Uh, talk about the the exposure that you had to this type of propaganda in China. So. Um, my biggest experience with it was with the education system and through media as well. Um, you know, starting from, you know, the first year of your school, they basically destroy that whole idea of individuality. You know, everything's a group drill. You know, you start every morning lined up formation, you know, saluting the flag and, you know, listening to the national anthem. Um, and all education was obviously state controlled and it wasn't really about learning as much as it was about just cramming in all this information that we want you to know. So it was just basically, you know, memorizing multiplication tables and a scrub version of history. Sounds like my <laughs> elementary school experience. Because <laughs> we, <would, laughs> we would get to school, we would stand up, say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> mm. You sit down and then uh, we'd be taught whatever they were teaching that day, you know. Right. But, you know, we also had the uniforms, a little red handkerchief, you know, chiefs and everything. Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, and then always with media, you know, they, you know, they would always love to, you know, show, you know, it was only, you know, the Revolutionary Army driving out the Japanese forces, you know, in World War Two. side. Yep, it was, you know, you didn't know America existed or, you know, they went in aid at all. And obviously didn't know about the Tiananmen Square massacre until I had left China and not until, you know, not for a few years after that. Oh, really? Yep. So, oh. yeah, they they don't tell anyone about it. Um, they have it that much on lockdown there, huh? Yeah, it's U.S., you know, younger Chinese people these days and they won't know what happened on that day. So still it's, don't know, huh? People that no, they have a control to that that's, level. That's that that's where I can confirm in the Soviet Union. You you you've heard of the Holodomor, the famine that killed like six to ten million people by different estimations, uh, in Ukraine in the nine, uh, early nineteen thirties. Um, I learned that that happened only in the late eighties when information started to come out. During, oh, wow. you know, when the Soviet Union was already breaking up. Until then, there was not a word. And I lived in Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine. And I never heard about the famine in Ukraine because it was so thoroughly suppressed and it was dangerous. If you were those who talked about it, they would probably be, you know, sent to jail. And well, at first, I mean, in, in my time, it was a little more liberal, but still they would probably have a talk with the KGB. They'd be dealt with. They'd be dealt with, yes. <laughs> be dealt with severe, I'm sure. Uh, so how long were you in Soviet Union, Oleg? Mm. Uh, I came here at the age of 34. So 
Wow. Already a mature guy. So I, I worked there. I had a family there. Had three children. I brought my wife and three children here to America. You've been here for how long? Uh, okay, I came in '94, so all uh, no That's secrets. I was born in 1960. <laughs> I'm 60, 61 now. So, now while you were in Russia, you were part of their uh, agitation committee. Is that correct? No, no, no. I um, I was at the bottom of the food chain there. Uh, you know, when I was a young guy. Um, I signed up to work as a as visual propaganda artist at the um, at a company. When I lived in Siberia for three years, uh, there was uh, it was just a job that I took. I I described this whole thing in my book uh, here, uh, Hotel USSR. Uh, it's like fact-based fictional life story, kind of, <laughs> okay. and. Uh, uh, so I just worked as an artist and doing uh, posters uh, of uh, happy workers uh, fulfilling their uh, five-year plans ahead of schedule, and you know party leaders, Lenin, uh, and so did, Were you told what to what to draw, or did you have a, a choice? Is like, all right, here's what you here's your parameters. Knock yourself out, or do they say we want you to do? this specifically uh there was we had the the so-called party organizer the, the guy in charge of he didn't organize parties he, he was the enforcer of, of the party uh, rule uh, and uh he had a catalog made in moscow centrally by the uh you know the department of propaganda for to be distributed throughout the entire soviet union and all the uh, small fries like me would uh, take samples from that. So the, that party organizer would find a picture there on a the page, point that picture to me, and then I would uh, convert that picture into a poster that would be hanging in the town square. So, and you uh, did all this by hand, right? Is that correct? Yeah, it's by hand and with very bad, poor paint because. Uh, well, I, like I said, it was happening in Siberia, and uh, like I had a big barrel of paint that was over frozen and of very poor quality. Um, and uh, the, so Siberia, when we hear in America, when we hear Siberia, you know, that's like the big bad place where they send the naughty um, Russians. Is were you there? Well, it's huge. No, I went there voluntarily because there were. There was oil there, and they were paying high dollar, high top, you know, high ruble, <laughs> top ruble, yeah, uh, for for living there. So that's one of the because reasons. Because of conditions, yeah. nobody. And there was a little it. more freedom too, of freedom of movement, where yeah. and, um, a lot of people there were ex-convicts, because Siberia is still a place for prisons, and so a lot of people didn't want to go home. They either had nowhere to go or they couldn't, so they just stayed in Siberia, and the money was good, so, you know. But that, you know, one guy, my neighbor, when he found out that I was uh, an artist, his first thing, the first thing he told me that he suggested that I would uh, help him forge, uh, you know, fake IDs for, for guys, uh, and... Uh, what were the fake IDs used for? Made good money. Um, Basically, it's here in the States, you have uh, driver's licenses in the Soviet Union. They had and that they still have it uh, in Russia and other places, internal passports. It's like, you know, if you have a foreign passport. So that mm -hmm. was uh, similar. It was a book that, oh, actually, I may have one. It still has a hammer and sickle on it. So. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. You got one you could show us. Now, were these just so you could travel within country? Uh, like you know, state. well, kind of. It's like whenever somebody stops you, you have to show your ID, uh, your passport, and it had a passport number. That was your identification number. And then, you had, okay, here it's a little bit already deteriorated. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is the cover, and this is the first. Oh, wow. 
page, then this is the second page, my name, my signature. This is my photograph at 16 years old when I got the passport. And then later, I don't remember at what age, I had to put another photograph because I already looked older. And then we had uh, the so-called, uh, what is it? Uh, the marriage record that I was married. Then okay. children, uh, the children were also written into the passport. And then the the so-called dreaded propiska, it's the um, where you live. You had needed to have a stamp of your residence. And if you leave, you had need to needed to have another stamp also signed by the bureaucrat that you're leaving that place. And then you had to get another stamp similar to that. So I have these. Um, Every time you came and went, you had to get it stamped and signed? Right. I had to show and present my passport. And if I... I couldn't get a job if I was if I didn't have that uh, record that I, of residence, and um, I couldn't get a record of residence in another city if I didn't have a job, and so it was a catch twenty two. Moving to another city was almost impossible. It was like immigrating to another country. Oh wow! So uh, is it still that way today? Um, I I'm not sure. Maybe it's easier, but. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure in big cities like Moscow or uh, St. Petersburg, it should be like that because um, it, the whole thing is so centralized in Russia. I'm talking about Russia. Ukraine is a little bit like that, but it's now an independent country. Um, mm -hmm. In Russia, they um, everybody wants to live in Moscow. Moscow is the best. It has the highest living standard. The salaries are higher, and uh, it's almost like a Western European city. It's clean. Uh, everything else outside of Moscow is crap and drab. And so um, everybody wants to live there. And if the government didn't control that, then the population of Moscow would be like 50 million people or <laughs> more. And that would be, you know, problematic. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, they would just have to expand their borders. Yeah. So population yeah. control, you know, it was necessary from the very beginning. The communists instituted that to you. Uh, you had to, uh, you needed to have a job, you needed to have a, a passport, you needed to have a place to live. If you didn't um, have one of those, then you were uh, a suspect. You know, now, if you didn't have a job or you didn't have one of those, would they provide one for you? Would the, the uh, well, government? not the one that you liked. The, yeah, they would say here is a, an opening for a street sweeper. We expect yeah. you at 7 a.m. You know, tomorrow morning, and if you don't show up, uh, they'll give you another warning, and then uh, you'll be sent to a labor camp as a parasite. There was a special, um, like felony type of, of per per parasitism of not working, and they used that also to, uh, like they used it on one uh, uh, Russian poet, Joseph Brodsky, who later became the Nobel Prize winner in literature. But in his youth, he, he was sent to uh, uh, to an exile in the north for par par parasitism. They said, uh, who are you, uh, uh, why aren't you working? I, I am working. So what is your work? Uh, what do you do? I write poetry. And who, who appointed you to be a poet? Uh, <laughs> is it God? There is no God. <laughs> They didn't consider that work at all. So, uh, Bill, I know you were young when you were in China, but I'm sure you probably heard stories um, mm -hmm. from your parents and relatives. Um, what what kind of, uh, you know, like Oleg was describing there as far as, you know, having the passport and the job right. and things like that. What was, uh, what was the society set up like in China? So when, when the Cultural Revolution happened, um, a lot of people were displaced uh, forcibly. And um, my mother's side had actually came from, I guess, what you would kind of call like the courts back then of China. So, you know, they were forcibly relocated. You know, I guess my grandfather on that side was lucky enough to keep his life, but he lost everything. And I, my mom, till this day, still doesn't know, you know, where her you know, quote unquote hometown actually is. 
Oh, wow. Um, but as far as the passport thing, um, yeah, China has something like that, but it's not anywhere near, wasn't anywhere near as detailed. Um, and basically, it, you know, tells you the same thing. This is where you're from. This is where your kids will go to school. If you leave out, you know, if you leave this area for work, you take your kids with you, you can't, you know, they can't get education. You can't legally attain housing and everything like that. You know, so basically, like Oleg was saying, moving was an official experience, basically. So you yeah. had to, you know, make sure you basically knew the right people and had the right reasons. Like here, we just pick up and I, you know, I could move to to the next city over or whatever. I could move to Idaho and, you know, it's really no big deal. But yep. But there All we got to do is go to the DMV, fill out the paperwork and notify the Postal Service, right? Yeah, yeah it, it, even if we do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you needed to have an invitation from a company. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, you're an engineer and this company requires you. So they write a, issue a paper that they need you and then you pre present that paper to whatever authority, right? And uh, that's that was one thing. You could marry somebody and that's why there were bogus marriages just like here in America, people marry for uh, for a green card. Or there, people would get married just to move to another city. That also oh, and and like what Oleg was saying earlier about how you know everyone will want to live in Moscow. It was the same thing, you know, or it still kind of is in China, where everyone wants to be in Beijing, mm -hmm. and you know that's the seat of political power and this and that. You know, it's the biggest city, and and funny enough, because of population, they did have to expand the city over and over and over again. Um, but like he was saying, with population control, to even enter Beijing on, you know, a identification card that says you're not from Beijing, you had to have official business. And all traffic coming in and out of Beijing, no matter where, is stopped and searched, even to this day. So, you know, that's the length they'll go still for uh, control of who control. gets in and out of the capital. Well, and that's been one of the things that's truly terrifying to me is the readiness with which people in this country and especially in Canada are signing up for this kind of system. And, you know, in Paris right now, there's some video released recently of uh, French or Parisian police officers walking up to uh, a table in Paris and asking for their papers and people behaving as if, you know, reacting mm -hmm. to that as if it's fine. And, you know, papers, in, yeah. in Ontario, it's the same thing right now where, or I don't know, it's suspended, <laughs> and a lot of the police officers refuse to enforce that travel ban. Um, but, you know, the the speed with which authoritarianism has has rushed in in the era of COVID is, is really shocking. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a story that you guys are going to find silly, but I'm going to give it to to inform a question. And uh, I spent around 20 years in California before I managed to get out. And when I had, it wasn't, I came before my family, but I flew back and then drove the family, my family in the family car back. And when I hit the Idaho, first when I left the California border, but really when I hit the border of Idaho, I had this extreme elation that didn't go away for several months. And I still kind of pinch myself sometimes at being being here as opposed to what it was like in California. Now, obviously, California bears very little resemblance to the authoritarian regimes. You know, it's in the same direction, but the magnitude is totally different. Do you guys remember, and I suspect it's different, Bill being seven, um, um, but Oleg, for you, reaching America, would you mind describing that experience and um, on an emotional or, or practical level, whatever you think is interesting? All right, quite a few things uh, struck me that I didn't expect. Well, not not even that I expect. You see, what propaganda did was that it uh, not um, it created the completely wrong image of uh, America and the West in general. And um, I knew that that was the wrong picture, but I didn't have enough sources to know what the right picture is. So. I came kind of unprepared and open to everything. And what, uh, it didn't even surprise me, but it uh, uh, kind of 
Okay, I, I'll just tell you what I saw, and uh, because it's hard to to describe the feeling. Um, like I said, that everything in in the old country was very centralized. It was centralized economy with central planning, and uh, everything things were being distributed centrally and planned centrally. So uh, the best, all the best things were in the center, and people would sometimes go to Moscow to buy even food to bring it home. And like I lived in Ukraine, uh, which uh, was, which is a place where a lot of food is being produced, but that food was not available in our stores. And whenever I would uh, go on a business trip, I was sometimes sent to Moscow on a business trip when I worked as a translator for a research institute at some point, um, they, they would send me to Moscow. I would buy uh, salami, um, cheese, not not even that was very much, uh, wasn't big diversity of that, but at least some types of that were available. And so I would bring it home. So when I came to America, uh, any small town, even a gas station, had more stuff and more variety of uh, goods than the biggest store in the Soviet Union. Uh, wow. In, in Moscow at the time. Not not anymore, of course, right now, any, um, you know, in Russia and Ukraine, uh, stores have everything because uh, they have sort of a, at least a semblance of the free market. Um, and uh, at that time, no. So it was uh, shocking to come to a store and see all that variety. And I came there with some American friends who told me, okay, we'll uh we uh, we're gonna have lunch like uh, what would you like to eat because we, we just wanted to get something quick and uh, eat outside of the supermarket somewhere on the bench um and i was looking at all those things like thousands of things and i had no idea what they meant what they were because we never had those products at home so i was uh i picked <laughs> so stupid I picked uh, a box of potato salad and a carton of chocolate milk. And <laughs> that didn't go well together at all. <laughs> so I, I was a learned. complete idiot. Uh, the first time uh, I went to uh, Delhi to to get a sandwich, and the guy started asking me what I want on my sandwich, and I had no idea what to say. Uh, he said, what kind of bread? I said, bread? I mean, we only had one kind of bread. What kind of, <laughs> what do you mean? What kind of bread? Um, it has to be white and soft. Okay. So then cheese, what kind of cheese? I don't know. What, what, what kind are they? Well, there's American provolone, uh, this and that, Swiss. All right, let's make it Swiss. I never heard of any of those names uh, before. So, okay, then what? And so on and so forth, and uh, it it was a torture just to get a sandwich made. Mm -hmm. So that's decisions, decisions. That was one of the things. But you know, a lot of people uh, uh, tell the story how they first came to the supermarket and they started crying that all their sacrifice was in vain. Like they were, they spent all this uh, all their lives sacrificing for a better future, thinking because they were told by propaganda that. Uh, if they don't have something, that's only because we're going to live better very soon. It's because we're uh, we just need to get over this difficult period, and uh, everything will be great uh, in the future. So everybody was uh, waiting and suffering, and and now they come to uh, to America and see all these goods, and nobody is suffering, nobody is waiting. Everything is available. They don't wait for the future. They just have it now. Uh, but I had a similar moment, like to tears, when I went to an art supply store. Oh, in yeah. the Soviet Union, we couldn't. If you weren't a member of the artist union, you couldn't get art supplies. Oh, and wow. so that, and I came to to this American store. There were so many more more art supplies that I knew existed, and maybe in one store more than they had in the, the entire Soviet Union. And um, that you didn't need any papers to show in order to buy <laughs> right. it. Right. It's, yeah, they weren't uh, controlled substances. You don't have to be an artist here in America to go buy artist uh, supplies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on the, 
also so, America has some very good artists, but uh, I'm also surprised how sometimes you see such poor quality, and especially those who try to uh, imitate uh, like plagiarized Soviet posters, and not like me, I'm making parodies of them just to make fun of them, but uh, there are some people who take it seriously. Like a lot of Antifa posters are uh, basically uh, uh, remakes of uh, old Soviet posters. In the uh, days of the Occupy movement, that actually started. There was a rise in uh, recycling old Soviet propaganda posters, and I recognized them from before. They just substituted certain things. And, uh, and I was wondering, what the hell is going on with these artists? It's like art, art schools are, you know, the teachers in art school are all communists or something. And then I, I realized that maybe that is true. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I think it's the nail on the head there, uh, especially nowadays. But uh, let's talk about let's let's kind of rewind a little bit and in, in the agitprop and let's talk about how in in these communist countries that again how it was used to control the people or overthrow in the beginning overthrow an existing government. Uh, how they use that to uh, I guess, spread disinformation and, um, like you said, control the narrative of of people's views on, on what was actually happening. Well, you don't have to go far. You just see it in front of you right now. That's what <laughs> they're doing. You know, there are, uh, the left has two modes of operation, offense and defense. Or uh, Right now they are in offense. Those are different strategies, you know, like if you're, like know about military, you know, you do things differently, you position your supplies differently when you're in defense or in defense. So right now the left is in offense and their their propaganda is more has more stealth to it and they are um, doing it in one certain way. In the Soviet Union, they were in defense. They already owned everything. So they wanted to protect so there were more, there were conservatives basically. They're the Soviet version of conservatives, they're trying to conserve the system, the old system. But when and, Stalin was trying to take power, um, mm -hmm. talk talk about that because that's what they used for him to basically move into power. Was well, was the Lenin basically and Trotsky created the revolution itself. Stalin wasn't the main guy there. And afterwards he killed everybody who knew that fact that he wasn't the main guy in the revolution because he wanted to be the biggest hero. Um, so Lenin uh, was uh, the editor in chief at some point of a communist newspaper and that newspaper published a lot of propaganda and then there, um, they were creating flyers and there were uh, special agitators. It was the kind of a, uh, title for something like what Obama did. It's community organizer. There were like professional agitators who would go to uh, people where pe places where people meet to factories um, and distribute those flyers and those newspapers to show and to tell people it was called agitate, tell them how long this can last, uh, people, you are being exploited. Uh, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists are uh, taking uh, the lion's share of everything and leaving you to starve. They have no soul, they have no conscience. We have to overthrow them and take away their factories and land from the landowners. And uh, a lot of people fell for that. And uh, so still, still the Bolsheviks who created the revolution, they were a tiny, a percentage of the population, but they were the most active and the most ruthless, most ruthless. And everybody else was just uh, watching, either sympathetically or not. But, you know, they told uh, the workers, the factory to the workers, and then eventually the government took over those factories because the workers can't manage them. They, have no, they don't know how. So everything was in ruins for a while and the country was starving. And then they had to uh, introduce uh, government management in the factories because the factories couldn't work, couldn't function when the workers supposedly owned them. Uh, and the workers were just stealing everything from the those factories because they're theirs. Um, then same thing, they told land to the farmers and the farmers uh, were also uh, 
happy some of them were happy to just go and burn the mansions of the big landowners and uh, kill them and uh, you know take away that land and then the land was collectivized by the government anyway and all those farmers the ones who could work wound up in uh, either dead or in, in Siberia and the ones who couldn't work they joined the collective farms and the country started began to star again <laughs> so yeah we're seeing kind of the same thing and not exactly and I'm, I'm I may be misspeaking here but in South Africa and Zimbabwe um, both of uh, those situations had very highly developed agriculture and you know all, also obviously some real barbarity towards native Africans or black Africans because um, at a certain point when does a Rhodesian become a native African even though they have white skin um, but in the repossession of white owned farms the production has just fallen through the floor and uh, there's a lot to be said for skilled, hardworking people staying on land. Um, th uh, this is a term that I, for whatever reason, find very attractive. But kulak is the word for those those wealthy. Uh, oh, yeah, words. yeah so, that's the word, and it's uh, it means a fist, but it's uh, uh, like metaphorically. I don't know why they were called the kulaks, but yeah, the uh, rich, wealthy farmers. And usually, they were the ones who knew how to organize work and they had usually hired laborers and uh, so and that made them kind of capitalists uh, so the hired labor laborers would uh, denounce them and kick them off their land and then they would just start drinking and um, the farm would just fall apart mm -hmm. uh, that's what happening in in africa too except maybe minus the drinking they do other things uh, but look, uh, in China, uh, I know there was famine. It was a similar model. Mm -hmm. uh, the land was collectivized, right? And, uh, yep. and so the, no production, no food was being generated. Yep. And pretty much um, they basically had, you know, I, for, I don't know what they would have called it, but it was basically forced, you know, um, forced education. So, you know, every young person would have to go through this where they would, you know, Get shipped off to the countryside um, and they would be all of a sudden thrown into manufacturing production or agriculture with you know almost no knowledge of it at all and they're just expected to come out of this you know as the perfect worker you know for the regime and you know and you also saw that with the medical field you know in china there's all the stories of Okay, we're just going to pick all these girls. You guys are going to go train to be nurses, whether you like it or not. And, you know, a lot of knowledge was lost and just the general healthcare back then was just not, you know, it just wasn't good at all. Um, yeah, and my mother was directly affected by that too, you know, um, when she was giving birth to me. The doctors were panicking and she almost, you know, bled out just because they really didn't have that much knowledge. And that's a scary thing. Yeah. I want to move to, um, uh, to Oleg here. So um, talk about the, the different forms that we're seeing here in America of the agitation uh, propaganda. Again, League of Pirates, you know, if you guys follow them, you know that's kind of what they, they specialize in. You've got a website, Oleg, uh, called The People's Cube. Is that right? Yes, the people skip uh, Which you you kind of specialize in that as well. Um, and both sides, I guess, it's not just one sided. This agitation propag uh, propaganda isn't just one sided. It, you know, both sides are engaging in this, and it's becoming more and more prevalent uh, here in America. Uh, so talk about uh, some of the the things that maybe people are seeing that they don't they don't recognize it readily as this type of propaganda? Well, um, it goes on different, not just different, takes not just different forms, but it also uh, goes on different levels. And uh, actually the left, propaganda in general is a collectivist thing. So the right, individualistic right is not as good at it as the left uh, does. We can just do some counter propaganda, um, but they usually always initiate it and we're just the reactionaries, we react. 
Uh, remember how Obama would often suggest that his agenda was failing, not because it was wrong, but because it was not being perceived properly. The people failed to understand it because they were not paying attention or he was not clear enough. Remember, he would say, let me be clear. Uh, or, uh, or maybe because the media was doing a bad job delivering the message. So, um, well, Biden says that a lot also, you know, let me well, be crystal that, clear. Let me be crystal brain, clear. Yeah. To, to every problem or rejection, the, the only answer is change the perception that was in his mind. Uh, change the perception of it in the people's minds and the problem will cease to exist. It's also the result of postmodernist philosophy, which uh, with its, you know, <clears throat> moral relativism that states that there is no right or wrong. Everything is uh, a matter of perception. And mm -hmm. uh, if you change the perception, the wrong can become right. And that's because uh, the, the left believes that uh, human mind is a social construct and therefore it can be changed through, uh, through manipulations, calculated manipulations. Remember, we're, in the beginning, we're talking about the Kantian philosophy. That's uh, par partially where it came from. Um, and uh, today's collective is the government with the Biden at the head, but he's not actually at the, at the helm. He's just pretending to be. Um, mm -hmm. So there, uh, transforming America and the mainstream media is performing the propaganda role of the, you know, they're the propaganda arm of the Democrat Party. And uh, they create a simplistic two-dimensional picture um, for us uh, of how great all the Democrats are and how successfully they lead the country, while everyone with a little bit of a brain knows that, uh, you know, we just see a failure and destruction. And just like with the resignation of Cuomo, he was uh, oh, yeah. he um, he had to resign uh, officially because of the sexual harassment claims, but and that was probably made just to preserve uh, his legacy as a governor. And uh, Biden just said he did a hell of a job, but basically he is a murderer <laughs> who uh, mm -hmm. killed thousands of. Uh, elderly people by sending them to the COVID hospital, to uh, the nursery homes, the COVID nursing homes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't know if that was the plan, but uh, apparently his uh, bloated budget uh, with a big deficit um, could be a little bit cured by dispatching all those old people who no longer needed uh, any government support. So yeah. I don't know how much of that factored in, but uh, he's an evil guy. But anyway, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the propaganda uh, tried to create the picture of uh, Governor Cuomo as the hero who was very successful in leading the war, while at the same time Florida was a hellhole of sickness and uh, disease with uh, Governor DeSantis who didn't know yeah. what he was doing. Well, in reality, everything is the complete opposite. <laughs> So, contradiction is the heart of to... the agitation propaganda. It's contradiction. They try to contradiction. But also, you know, propaganda is a simplification of reality. So the drawing simplified two-dimensional people on a propaganda poster is the same as flattening individuals under an ideological press, squeezing out and discarding their humanity and leaving only a single arbitrary characteristic, whether it's a gender or race, their nationality, profession, ethnicity, or religion. And uh, that uh, creates a simplified two-dimensional uh, vision of the world in the minds of the target audiences. Mm -hmm. It's not a very complicated picture. Uh, so, and such a vision lends itself perfectly into the simplified uh, art of visual propaganda. That's what it is. It's flat two dimensional images that uh, desc describe the reality in a simplified form. And uh, unsurprisingly, propaganda works best for collectivist ideologies that uh, scorn and dehumanize the individual. A uh, collectivist uh, vision of an ideal society in itself is much like a propagandistic poster. It's flat, simple, often embellished, and always lacking details, which is very important. They never <laughs> talk about details. In general, it all looks great, but when you look at the details. Yeah. And, and, of course, they're uh, always twisting the 
you know, the, the facts to meet their, you know, their agendas, uh, twisting and, and matching, even though, you know, what they're saying is we can tell on the onset is it just doesn't make sense, you know, especially with all this COVID, you know, bullshit. Perfect example of, of the agiprop that they're using to push and promote this, you know, this vaccination agenda. Right. And that's, uh, that there is a lot of propaganda, media propaganda there, but that's so obvious. It's not even funny. And, um, so yeah. there are, so that was, um, uh, I'll touch on the government propaganda a little bit. Uh, but now we have, uh, something like grassroots propaganda. If we, if you can call Antifa grassroots, because they're all organized from above, but there are enough, uh, useful idiots there among them that we can call them well, again, it's yes. that it's that you know hiding the obvious of what's actually going on they make it look like it's grassroots you know like you said when it's actually right. not but look and um, this ties into this covid thing you know antifa has been recycling a lot of soviet art lately and in fact it started with the occupy movement and i recognize a lot of that art um this is like a like a bad dream i'm trying to escape it it's uh, <laughs> you know uh, completely in irrational, unnecessary horror <laughs> that is following me from the Soviet Union to America. And <laughs> you, you ever had a nightmare where you're, you're trying to escape from some danger, but your legs uh, turn to cotton like pillows and you can barely move and the enemy is approaching fast. And that's... Uh, that's why we train. So that's, <laughs> and and, and that, that's what, you know, this is the feeling I get now when I uh, when I look at the news, and it makes me want to scream and wake up. But there is no waking up in this case, you know. Uh, when they get us, we're done. So anyway, Antifa's preference for this simplistic century old Soviet-style posters and slogans is not coincidental, because it shows their true uh, dysfunctional self-image as a faceless mass of two-dimensional puppets whose strings get pulled by larger than life invisible leaders and notice their uh compulsion we know who their leaders are you know we know who their well, leaders are well we know some of the leaders who themselves may be puppets and uh so it's like several layers of puppeteers there. yeah and this goes back brian to an episode that we did with with jay the league of pirates you know we were talking about who who is they you know who are they yeah, and you know, I've thought back to that conversation many times since we had it, because at the time, you'll recall, I said that it's a waste of time to focus on they, you know, that, that that's a distraction. And unfortunately, I've been proven totally wrong. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, mea culpa on that one. And I think that's the big bumper sticker of this whole thing, is that if you didn't... Um, if you didn't believe in the deep state then, well, you sure should now, you know, and also just the global elites. It's a real thing. And when you yeah. see Bill Gates, you know, behind WHO, I think he's he's either the number one or number two donor to WHO. It's and that people think that that who is a um, an official organization and it kind of isn't. Um, and then when you see his ties back to Epstein, you know, that's the purportedly the actual reason for his divorce is that he went to that island a lot and um, all these people being tied together with very few connections um, is creepy um, one I I've, I wish I could have uh, bolded underlined and italicized Oleg's definition of propaganda I thought that was brilliant and I just looked up on the um, you know, Merriam-Webster and all the uh, all the rest. Um, and their definitions aren't a pimple on the ass of the one that uh, that Oleg just dropped of, of the simplification and, and 2D, um, you know, flattening of ideas to make them into e the way Jay would put this. And he's having trouble getting in at the moment. We're trying to get him back in. But he would talk it. I think he would say something like, taking information and distilling it down to bite size, easily digestible servings or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I, think, I think my my view of propaganda prior to this conversation was kind of like that old definition of porn. You know, you know what when you see it, 
But I think right. that the underlying the mechanism that Oleg is describing is that's a really deep concept that that, that I'm slightly smarter for knowing. Actually, I think there is a deep connection between porn and Soviet so, uh, um, socialist realism, because in, in either case, uh, you know, yeah. the, the final result is already known. It's just you need to create a situation where that will lead to that. And everybody knows where it will lead and how it will lead. It. <laughs> and they both make it hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all work hard there, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but going back to Antifa, you notice their compulsion to hide their faces be behind masks. They're all uniform masks. In the day of, of the Occupy movement, those were the uniform Guy Fox masks. They were all ha having the same face. Now Antifa changed that to black masks or gas masks. And now the government requires us all to wear the COVID masks uh, in a way that mask is the ultimate symbol of collectivist anonymity. And that's kind of a metaphor for where we're heading. Uh, I heard of uh, yeah. flat, um, individ not even individual, flat uh, figures without any individuality, without any content. Uh, so, um, you know, in the Soviet Union, at least, I, I told you the, before the show how um, I I got to work in the this propaganda, and um, you know the officials who were actually in charge of propaganda they either uh, had to believe in those propagandistic messages, uh, or um, you know not not to go insane, or they were heavily drinking in order to suppress any uh, doubts in themselves. And then for others, those posters mostly served a decorative purpose, uh, which is was more common in my day and age when I was working. Because when I was this propaganda artist, I in, in America you have a lot of uh, bright spots in the streets, all these uh, uh, billboards and uh, advertisings on the walls of the buildings. In the Soviet Union, they didn't have any commercial advertising, and the only um, bright spots in the drab environment were the propaganda posters so sometimes people were even grateful they didn't because they are the bright and attractive you know yeah no, not, obviously towards the end you know uh already in the 80s nobody cared what was on those posters they were just there for decoration and a lot of people wouldn't even uh read them you know it just uh, it was just a bright spot uh, just an accent in the landscape. Uh, but, you know, that's the the uh, the Soviet artists had no other way of doing it, you know, uh, and they were that was also a way of getting a living wage. But uh, the Antifa graphic artists, on the contrary, do their this quasi Soviet propaganda by choice. And they create these two dimensional representations of life and people based on their two-dimensional vision of humanity. That's why they're doing it. The, no, the driving indeed. force behind their artistic and spiritual self-mutilation is a matter for another story, of course. I mean, I can talk. <laughs> we can have another show just for about that. Who was going to talk there? Oh, no. Do you really think, well, do you think, you know, the popularity of, you know, former Soviet propaganda art is popular, you know, with some of these younger generations or groups because of pop culture, you know, with the, you know, Che, you know, che Guevara shirts and things like that. Do you think it's just been ingrained into them through media and pop culture that, you know, this means freedom instead of something else? I think, you know, because complex multidimensional ideas are not likely to spur large groups of perfect strangers to unite in a swift and coordinated action. So um, that can only be accomplished with a simplified message that isolates a single common characteristic in different people and exaggerates it to the point of existential importance. So um, you can, in order to do, to organize all these kids into action, uh, the whoever the masterminds behind this whole movement I were uh, had to create to answer your question, uh, this kind of um, uh, recycling, you know, re resurrect the 
old Soviet propaganda. Um, remember James Carney, oh, what's his name? James Carney, right? The uh, Obama spokes spokesperson. He once was photographed in his house, you know, like one of the glowing pieces that the uh, media was uh, giving to Obama and his people. And on the those photographs, they had Soviet propaganda posters in the uh, in the background, and uh, that was very telling. And I, I'm not saying that he himself is a uh, like a Politburo member of the Communist Party, but uh, the the fact that he took interest in it. I know Jordan Peterson takes interest in Soviet propaganda, but that's for a different reason, I'm sure, because uh, that's something that he. It's like uh, for him, it's probably more like collecting uh, like dried poisonous snakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Let's one thing about... that, that, that Jordan Peterson talks about a lot is um, the brilliance, and not not in a good way, but the brilliance of Hitler um, to motivate or um, increase the disgust reflex. He uh, he compared Jews to termites, cockroaches, rats, you know, things that, that, that carry disease. And one thing that's been really troubling for me to see is with the vaccination propaganda that the unvaccinated own the epidemic, according to the, to the Democrats or to the, to the left establishment body. Um, and there's very much that same technique being used to pin disease onto a certain group of people that are being othered, you know, that are not us. They are the others. Shame. They're shaming. There's a lot of shaming going on. I, I can't remember. Uh, some school board lady was uh, just recently called out uh, because she was uh, shaming the children in her district or whatever it may be and saying that they are killing other kids by not wearing their masks to school. Their murder, she said murdering. Is yeah, and, and that, that shame driver is, is profound and powerful and gross in its own right, but this disgust reflex that Peterson describes is, is almost like, you know, the umami flavor in, in Japanese cooking. That's this, you know, this flavor that Americans didn't even really know about that the Japanese brought to the table. It is sounds it like- disgust reflex is a is a sort of a direct path to your lizard brain that appears to be being used oh like do you have any any observations on that or and or bill like yeah uh, uh yeah both of you uh can you simplify the question please uh, for sure um hitler or all of Brian. <laughs> it's a little too high brow for me i'm sorry um hitler we understand compared Jews to cockroaches and that gave, gave the idea that they were unclean and were a parasite on society and used that word earlier as well. Um, how do you, um, do you see that as being a necessary or extremely powerful um, element in othering people, you know, like the parasite class that you were talking about, do you see do you right. see that same thing, or am I crazy? It's, no, it's called dehumanization and uh, demonization. Um, it's part of propaganda. It's, again, part of the uh, simplified uh, vision of reality. Um, and uh, you, there is a reason why propaganda appeals mostly to the uh, lowest basis, uh, basis to human instincts and uh, um, it's very good when you want to create uh, ethnic hatred or uh, call people to redistribution of wealth, uh, cause envy. It 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 call it um, invokes the basest uh, instincts in in a human being basically. Well, sometimes it can also be uh, in, like elation, uh, cause uh, excitement. Uh, it's it's like a drug basically where uh, you um, you can get you get hooked on it, and you need a reinforcement of uh, your of that vision of reality if you already bought it, and uh, then you get elated when you find that confirmation, and then um, you're you have a withdrawal if you don't, and then it also like drug leaves you 
um, defenseless against uh, uh, the reality. And, uh, you know, you have a, who does a good job of that is um, we were talking earlier about Sasha Baron Cohen in his mm -hmm. Borat, um, whatever they're called, I guess you call them films, um, where he will belittle or make Southerners look, you know, like stupid redneck backwards yeah ass you know idiots uh, and he does that in his film uh, the the most recent one there's two guys with jay and james or something like that i can't remember what they were called but um but they edit that stuff to make it look again to, to serve their purposes because the, they showed some outtakes of of those two guys countering his points that borat was making you know, very intelligent, um, logical points, but they edited all that out, obviously, to yeah, to, yeah. to make their point that you know, all of Trump followers are backwards ass Bubba rednecks. Hollywood does that a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. remember, you know, the everybody at some point this uh, notion of this uh, lady named Riffenstahl who was Hitler's uh, propagandist, who was a talented filmmaker, and they made, he made that documentary, The Triumph of the Will for the Nazis. That was a great, doc, very powerful, impactful documentary, but it had all the, all the wrong messages. Um, but it presented it in the uh, most uh, beneficial way. So um, all these leftists are wringing their hands and... Uh, trying to uh, you know talking about how is it possible this a talented person could take the side of the nazis without realizing that they themselves are doing exactly the same thing um they just you know the anti-fascists today are the fascists of today are the anti-fascists i saw a meme today of course memes are i guess the new agiprop um one of, one of the forms of agiprop but uh, it was talking about, you know, if you ever questioned if you would have followed the Nazis, you know, fell into their their way of thinking, um, are you wearing a mask, you know, kind of thing. So it was just basically pointing at people as like, yeah, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to give right. in, you're going to follow something, this is the start of it. So this is yeah, how you know how they uh, talk to about. They talk ironically about or sarcastically about the good Germans, meaning that the good Germans were the ones who went along with the Nazis, but and they were just being good citizens. They they were following the orders. But aren't all these uh, Biden supporters, all these people who wear masks while driving in the cars alone, are aren't they being good Germans? Um, they being good Nazis, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Uh, so. Mm, what I was going to say that um, the the government needs to, you know, the powers that be uh, need a forced consensus and propaganda helps them to do that. And it makes it easier to stay in power and continue to do what they're doing. And a dumped down perception of reality that they're enforcing um, is it desynthesizes us and to the evil around us that they create and that um, the suppression of human nature in human beings makes it easier for people to become monsters. That's the result of propaganda. And it brings us back to the Nazis. We all know that the Nazis were monsters. But what um, was to a large extent, <clears throat> that was to a large extent the result of the totalitarian propaganda that they were exposed to. But in, in the Soviet Union, um, uh, they had quite a few monsters as well, although although the left doesn't like to talk about that. Uh, and uh, those uh, people reported on the dissenters. They uh, created and maintained the gulags. And who was uh, killing and torturing people in the gulags? The same Soviets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like they're doing today here in America is like report your neighbor if they're not yeah, wearing their exactly. mask. And all of them, uh, or at least all, most of them, thought of themselves as good people doing good yeah good, like good germans or they good were Soviets. A good nazi yeah yeah exactly. um, they were doing good necessary work for the common good 
Uh, they all cared about the, and the Nazis also cared about the common good for the German nation. Uh, the, the, the Nazis also thought of themselves as good people doing good necessary work for the common good and a single, uh, not a single one thought of themselves as monsters doing evil work. Um, they needed propaganda to sustain that illusion also. So they yeah, wanted a degraded, and that, that reinforced their perverted values. And thus propaganda, once it takes root, becomes an addictive drug. And Absolutely. It, socialism on both sides, you know, the Nazis were socialists, the Soviets were socialists. That brings out the worst in people, the envy, the collective greed, the intolerance, the lack of responsibility. And, uh, you know, when uh, utopian socialist dreams uh, become the official direction of the country, they get in conflict with human nature. I write that in my book, you know, the uh, Shakedown Socialism. That I wrote Hold that up a little closer to the to the camera. I'm going to pop it up here. So uh, Oleg does have some books, and we're going to talk about those here a little bit and where you can go get those. And, um, oh, and I don't know. Talk it's, about that one, the Shakedown of Socialism. I hope it's not out of focus. So no, anyway, um, what I was saying that um, this, it brings the worst in people and... Um, um the um... So let's let's do this let's let's back mm -hmm. up a little bit and um i want to i want to go to our other guest here and you know we're kind of identifying here in america uh different forms and 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 where we can maybe identify agiprop and we've talked about a couple of different places but we haven't really gone to social media yet which is the biggest largest dissemination of of agiprop that that's available so let's go to bill and um bill give some examples of maybe some agiprop that you've seen um not necessarily on social media but you know other youtube it's everywhere right um so you know one of the big places that we see you know is definitely hollywood right and one thing that they don't really want to ever talk about is how they can satisfy a foreign market all of a sudden so now, you know, they're spending time to make China look better in movie because they want the box office sales there. And slowly that's just injecting, you know, more and more of, you know, anti-capitalist ideas or, you know, that maybe China's way greater than it is. And yeah. with social media, it's funny that you bring up the whole meme thing because yeah. you see a lot of these anti American memes now and these themes about, you know, getting back and our healthcare system. And you're even seeing a lot of, I guess what you call them influencers jumping on, you know, on the trend because that's what media has been talking about. And that's what the common good is. They'll just jump on the trend and, you know, promote something like getting the vaccine without even having any information themselves. Because it's the hot topic and that's going to get them more. It is the hot topic at the moment. That's what's going to get them seen. You know, oh, this person's way more acceptable. Advertisers will like them more. And, you know, slowly they just start building a new normal. Yeah. So very, very disingenuous on the, the social media, especially, like you said, those the bigger influencers when they're posting something, they've got ulterior motives as to why they're doing that. And usually it's financial. It's like they, they can hear the <clears throat> message they're they're posting or sending out, and probably ninety percent of them don't even know because they've got somebody else running that for them. You yep, know, and the, the trash. And, you know, post. their followers, their viewers. You know, they'll just almost blindly follow them because you know, as someone that's an influencer on social media or YouTube or anything like that, you do get to know them a lot more personally. You know, yeah. so you feel like you have this personal connection to them and whatever they say, you know, must be right because I like all his other ideas or his or hers other ideas. So this what also must be correct. Is, and Jay may have talked about this, um, but like these groups, like an Antifa, we'll just say Antifa or BLM or whatever, they'll start a, a social media page that's conservative. And, you know, they'll get all these conservative people, you know, and they'll get, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100,000 followers. 
and then they'll change their content that they're posting to be the opposite, you know, contradictory. But yet all these people that were following them at that point were following them because it was, you know, something like pro gun or something like that. And then they switch it to, uh, you know, black lives matter type type content. And then they've got all these, because I, I mean, I'll follow somebody and I may not ever see anything that they, you know, ever post though. And that, I think that's what the majority, of a lot of people do is they'll start following somebody because they see a post that they like and they're, Oh, that's relates to me. And that's cool. And I, you know, I like that stuff. Um, I thought that was very interesting. And that's a form of agiprop there too, is, you know, they'll sucker somebody into something and then, you know, they'll switch it on them kind of deal. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, and it's, you know, it's, like you said earlier, it's not these people a lot of times doing it themselves. It's, you know, they have producers or managers or whomever else. Big, there's big corporations and things behind this, you know, big. Absolutely, you know, organizations. Through advertising dollars, through everything else. And I, I think there are other governments involved, too. I think there's, you know, there's Russians, there's China, there's Chinese behind this, too. Yeah. Absolutely. You're seeing videos, you know, quote unquote, informational videos popping up on YouTube that's clearly labeled that it's sponsored by foreign governments. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are facts about America, right? Right, exactly. So, Did you guys catch um, John Cena was doing yeah. uh, media like a presser and was speaking, I think, in Mandarin, but I don't I don't know. Um, and he accidentally called Taiwan a country. And uh, he did this, I only could hear the translation that he did this, you know, ridiculous overdone apology for offending the people of China. Would you mind speaking to that briefly, Bill? And how's his Chinese? Like, it, the, the better it is, the more it worries me, if you know what I mean. Oh, right, yeah, it's, no, it's, um, you know, simple phrases like that, uh, you know, a lot of people can end up learning. It is, it is a very hard language to learn. You know, I still struggle with it from time to time. Um, but the whole Taiwan situation, you know, it's China. Till this day, we'll say it's part of, you know, communist China. Nothing ever happened. It's not like, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, the Democrat Party left over there. No, no, that never happened, you know. So... You brought up a good point a minute ago about Hollywood cowtown mm -hmm. to um, China because of the mm -hmm. box office sales. Absolutely. You know, the box office sales. And, you know, there's certain things that they will do and won't do and put in their movies because they don't want to offend their Chinese. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, it's, you know, from what I've heard, you know, the remake of Red Dawn was supposed to be, you know, with China as the, you know, the antagonist, but no one wanted to offend them so you know north korea here it is you know yeah right. yeah they'll they'll just call it the red pawn instead <laughs> yeah, that's for, and uh you know he just uh cena has just finished uh, filming his uh, next movie called career suicide squad <laughs> career suicide squad. <laughs> I, well, I would suggest to not to call it china or chinese it's chinese communist party the ccp that's right, true. right, right. Not the people itself. Yes. Right. So, and I, it kind of cringed me a little bit when uh, Americans would confuse uh, the what the Soviet communists did with the with the rest of the people, because the people is one thing, and the Communist Party was oppressing them. Just so, so right. um, both they, made a great point too, as yeah. as to the information that the people actually receive in China or Russia is they have no idea. You know that that a lot of this stuff is going on like you said you were how old before you knew about tiananmen square you know uh, i mean that, to to america yeah, i was probably in my yeah. early teens then you know yeah so i mean the people over there are like you said it's not the people it's the government right and you mm -hmm. know all media over there especially back then and you had cctv which is just you know the central chinese broadcasting you know networks and it was the same shows, you know, it was always something about the war, you know, we're, we're the underdogs, but we, you know, overcome, you know, all the evil Japanese and everything. And they still, you know, for a long time, they still use that whole common enemy thing and instilled a lot of, you know, hate towards Japanese people. Yeah. 
That's and, very yeah. uh, typical of propaganda. Speaking of propaganda, um, it requires to pit people against one another. Again, it's a simplistic vision of reality. Uh, in uh, China, they hate the Japanese. Same in Korea. Like uh, North Koreans are, all their movies are about the fights with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And in, in uh, well, I probably also with Americans, you know, since they have that more in the 50s. Uh, but in, in Russia, the cult of the Second World War, uh, which they call the Great Patriotic War, is still very strong and it's being um, massaged by the government. Uh, all the time, so they still continue to talk about it and make movies and uh, how they make the Germans the, the worst enemy and they need the image of the enemy. So basically the Germans represent the entire West and so we are um, always fighting, we're always being attacked, uh, we uh, need to stay together against this uh, Western enemy um, and we need to hate somebody. So. In China, it's the Japanese. In Russia, it's the Germans. Same, yeah. same thing. And I, I imagine that uh, the Chinese Communist Party learned a lot, learned a lot from the Soviet Union at the time. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. Mao absolutely. and Stalin were the best friends. But then, uh, when uh, Khrushchev started doing his reforms in the Soviet Union, then the Chinese Communist Party didn't like that because that <laughs> would uh, mean losing some of their power. So. Even though there was a cultural revolution going on and the people were starving, um, they were preparing for the war with the Soviet Union. There was a, actually a little a little fight on the border uh, where an entire island was destroyed and basically with the uh, uh, artillery mm, disappeared under the water. Uh, the Soviet artillery made it so. It was a border island that was disputed. And... Um, so what? I, oh, there was a joke when uh, Mao sends a telegram to Khrushchev saying, "Hey, our people are starving. Uh, send us uh, some bread." And Khrushchev sends a telegram back saying, we, "We don't have enough for ourselves. You have to tighten your belts." And so the Mao sends him a tel another telegram: "Send us belts." <laughs> <laughs> you know that's the, the the common enemy thing. There, there's an aspect that I don't think conservatives understand about liberals in the United States, and I'm not even sure how many liberals understand it about themselves or about their movement. But climate change was the hope, I believe, of uh, liberal elites to create a common enemy. You know, there used to be a lot of uh, discussion that we needed a Manhattan project, you know, the project to create the first atomic weapon, um, that there needed to be a Manhattan project level effort on climate change. And my suspicion is that what they were trying to do, and like I said, it never gets explicitly said out loud that this is the deal, but that the liberals were trying to come up with an enemy that wasn't a person or a people. You know, here's there's the enemy over there. It doesn't have a soul, but climate change is is the big problem, and our our sinful bourgeois way of living is is what the problem is, and so we need to fight against it together. Um, and the you know, there's been propaganda since the 60s or 70s that we only have 10 more years to stop climate change mm -hmm. before irreversible harm, and you know, the extinction of the human race is going to happen. That sort of thing. And uh, literally newspaper clippings from, I've seen them from the 70s. I'll try and pull them up here and link Marty so he can put it in the show. Um, sorry, please continue. Share your screen. You can share your screen. Um, the, the world has been here for how many billions of years? <laughs> and our little small time here on Earth, uh, and we, we're the ones affecting climate? Yeah, uh, propaganda is uh, very strong there. You know, like <laughs> how, uh, what's his name? Obi Wan Kenobi said, propaganda is strong with you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> with with uh, climate change, it's, it's completely ridiculous, and only a stupid will not see how that it's all pure propaganda. And yet, you know, the people who think that they're so much smarter than us. Um, they're the, <laughs> the gullible ones who fall for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and up on the screen right now is um, 1972 UN, UN Environment Protection Boss warns we have 10 years to stop the catastrophe. And this is, for those that want to check him out, this is the Twitter feed of an economist named Bjorn Long, Lomberg. Uh, Bjorn in the standard way, L-O-M-B-O-R-G. And he's been on Peterson's podcast a few times, and I believe he worked for the UN or the EU, and he, he, he did two very interesting things. He looked at what one dollar would do to, to lower human suffering around the globe. And, uh, you know, so dollar for dollar, what's the best way to have people um, do better? And climate change ranks down at number 11. Things like anti-diarrheal medication and polio vaccines rank at the top. And then the second question that he asked people around the world was how many of their own dollars would they like to contribute uh, towards stopping climate change? And the number is laughably small. And so it, it, he does, um, it, uh, Oleg was skillfully talking about the devil being in the details and that the details are not part of the conversation with collectivism. And Bjorn Lomborg is the guy with all of the the dirty laundry on climate change while still not at all contesting its existence. That's not- He's still theory. alive? Oh yeah, he's he's our age roughly. Uh, we need to get him on the show. I, he's kind of a big deal, but we could try. He's That'd kind be, of a big deal, oh, okay. He's like yeah. a Joe Rogan deal, so. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a Joe Rogan much. level dude, but we, we, we should try. I, that's, a, that's a pessimistic, the Talking Lead podcast is among the most prestigious. We understand. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll give it the college try. <laughs> so let's do this. I want to go, because we're running long on time, I want to I want to go to our listener questions, because we got a, we got a lot. We got a lot of listener questions here. But before I do that, I want to make sure, does anybody have any more questions uh, for Oleg or for Bill or for Brian amongst yeah. uh, our students here? I actually had one for kind of both Oleg and Bill, just with how you guys talked about the propaganda and how detailed information was controlled all the way down to, you know, his, history being scrubbed and things like that. What you see in the States now with certain words being filtered from social media and, you know, having to change content filters manually because they're just starting to hide certain things. Um, yeah, how about stop sharing your screen? Please. Thank you. So I don't even think you need to see on social media or anything like that, um, or education. It's the fact that, you know, we're already steady erasing America's own history, right? You know, slavery was wrong, all that stuff, this and that, but you know, you're basically trying to put white out over what our history actually was, right? Turn a blind eye to it and just, instead of setting it there as a reminder of, you know, what it was and maybe we don't want to be like that anymore. But, you know, they're just steady getting rid of all these things and soon enough, you know, the words are probably not going to be existing in common usage. That's a good point. Yeah, word manipulation is a big uh, art in their um, in this propagandist community, so so to say, if you will. Um, remember, there was this guy. Uh, what's it called? Kind of sounds like Jackoff, his last name. And uh, remember, Rush Limbaugh was making fun of his name too. Uh, so he came up with this whole theory of how we can. Um, change certain words, manipulate the language in order to make it sound different and make our the leftist message more positive on the oh, uh, yes. right way yeah. more negative. I mean, that, that those things have had been done before, but he uh, kind of created a, an entire uh, kind of scientific branch out of that. So, so in I'm Russia, just, it, it's called, yeah, uh, uh, you know, you were you mentioned other things, other forms uh, like uh, what Antifa was doing, creating a page with one content and then substituting it. It's not yeah. as much uh, propaganda. It's more of uh, what in Russia they call political technology, 
they're in Russia they're being a little more cynical about this and it's a you know official term political technology so all these people are political technologists there is a special science called technology well, I think that falls into the agitation uh, part of the yeah, yeah that, that is part of it of course but yeah you know, many ways of so you're talking about you know changing words and the meanings of words and um I was or, I was listening to the radio today and they were talking about um, in India, you know, curry. They use a lot of curry mm -hmm. uh, in Indian food, and um, supposedly that's been a, a that was a British term or something like that. And they're trying to change and get people to not use the word curry anymore in in India when referring to Indian food and stuff. And I, I thought that was ridiculous, but anyway. <laughs> Well, yeah, they, they are changing everything. They're changing the names of countries, the names of cities. It's like, uh, I don't know, what was wrong with Peking? They had to change everything, all the maps, and uh, to Beijing. I don't know. Uh, Bill, what, what do you think? If if um, if it was well, still called Peking. Peking, would it be a problem? It, it, it's funny. It's it's like, you know, the, the, the communist government there try to erase all, you know, forms of the past, right? So new names, you know things got shifted around but it, it's just like no matter what it is how small of a change you have to change it because if you leave anything that's kind of letting something go I feel like and they just can't have that yeah one of the features and maybe you guys can educate me and I know Marty you want to get on with it but I think this is really important that um, in communist countries God Brian <laughs> the revolution never ends, right? And Bernie uses that kind of language, our revolution. And Fidel Castro used to talk about the revolution in the present tense. Do you guys understand, you know, that, that goes to the, what Bill was just saying with that things always have to be changing and Oleg talking about next month we'll have food. Next month yes. we'll have food. Is that the deal or is there an, another part? What's your guys take on that with the, the revolution never ending? I think um, it's just, well, for China, it's uh, like everyone's united towards one China for the greater good of it and this and that. And I think, you know, for them, it really does instill this sense of nationalism. Um, Maybe not at all levels, but enough to where, you know, because for a long, for a long time, you know, Chinese people were just like, yeah, you know, we kind of just work in the factories, we manufacture stuff, this and that, you know, we export all our stuff to foreign countries, and all of a sudden, you know, they start pushing this China first policy and uniting the people, and you know, there seems to be a huge resurgence of patriotism over there due to it. Yeah, same here in Russia, they are doing, although it's no longer a communist country, but because there is no longer the communist ideology to unite the nation. So Putin is using nationalism to unite the nation and nationalism there is a little bit different because uh, when you have a multinational country like Russia or China uh, and only one ethnic group is in charge, then that nationalism is no longer called nationalism, it's, it's chauvinism, it's supremacism. Mm -hmm. And they are suppressing out, they call themselves the uh, big big brothers, you know, of, of the smaller brothers. So, uh, and uh, to answer your question about uh, how the this kind of permanent revolution, the, actually there was a term introduced by Trotsky, permanent revolution. Trotsky, of course, was the enemy of Stalin, so he, he had to kill him. Uh, but um, there are a lot of Trotskyites here in the United States, a lot more than there used to be in, back in the Soviet Union. Uh, they are talking about the permanent revolution, but um, it was more like, in our case, um, in the Soviet case, that we all lived in the present as a temporary condition to achieve the brighter future. So mm -hmm. there was no present. There was the dark past and there was the bright future. Mm -hmm. And we all were 
all waiting and suffering and trying to overcome the difficulties, just waiting for the bright, bright future to arrive. And on the, the People's Cube, my satirical website, we call it the, um, uh, the gl glorious world of next Tuesday. So <laughs> next Tuesday is going to come. Uh, you know, and Very when weird the, tomorrow. Tuesday come and they ask me questions, no, you're stupid. I told you next Tuesday. It's not this Tuesday, <laughs> it's next Tuesday. Um, Free so, tomorrow. Yeah. And there, so there was the dark past and the bright future, and there was a joke that what happens when you make, you mix a dark past and the bright future, you get the gray present. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, know I've never quite live. thought of COVID in the same way, but COVID kind of functions as that permanent revolution because it ain't ever going away. Uh, <laughs> let's get to the your question. We're running short on time. Sorry. That's okay. So go to uh, Instagram and Facebook, and let's field some questions. Uh, if you repost it on your site, Brian, check out, see if you've got questions there. Bill, I know you reposted. If you've got questions uh, on any of yours, we'll field some questions there. Oleg, I'm sorry. Again, I didn't I didn't tag you because I didn't know how to tag you. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, but we've got a lot of questions here, and I'm going to start off with this one. Uh, and it says... Um, for Oleg, this is uh, C Crazy Randy One. What is the most ridiculous piece of American propaganda um, you've seen regarding the former USSR? Uh, I haven't seen many. You know, um, that's uh, actually a whole another question. That how? Uh, propaganda on one side on the collectivist side you know the individualists have no need in propaganda they do not do that uh capitalism was never advertised or nobody did the propaganda of capitalism uh until the communists started denigrating capitalism and then somebody had to engage in counter propaganda and that sucks you in and again again creates uh, this simplistic uh, version of reality and then you have to um kind of know when enough is enough and stop you know, propaganda was um, initially, I think, probably started in the 19th century. Um, there was a lot of propaganda going on during the First World War, and there were American propaganda posters against the Germans. Um, and then there were, um, in Germany, there were their own. In Russia, there were a lot of propaganda posters during the First World War, even before the revolution. And so some of those propaganda artists became... Uh, started working for the communists later, so that started. But you know, the war propaganda is kind of justified, and uh, during the time of crisis, everybody turns collectivist because that's the only mode to survive. Like in the army, the army has to be collectivist, and it's not a bad thing because that's the um, that's how you should work as one unit, and one person needs to sacrifice for the uh, for the entire unit to to uh, for it to survive. But that's only that collectivism is the good moral code for the crisis mode, like in the war. When the crisis mode is over and there is a peacetime, we need to revert back to the collectivist, I mean, to the individualist mode. And that never happened uh, in communist countries. They all lived in the state of crisis all the time. They all uh, kind of cultivated this uh, collectivist mode of operation. And so propaganda was the best for it. So. Um, in America, I've seen some, uh, like in the 50s, there were propaganda films made describing the horrors of communism, but they, I don't think they are ridiculous. Uh, they were truthful. Then um, I don't remember anti-Soviet posters. There were a lot of anti-American posters in the Soviet Union, but I, I haven't seen any. If you can, if the reader can show me some, I can then... Uh, give my opinion, but so far I haven't seen sure. it. What about uh, what about you, Bill? Uh, same question for uh, for China. Um, currently, as far as propaganda, it's not too much comes to mind. But you know, it, a lot of it is. I guess what I the most recent thing is, you know, China is usually used, and a lot of times for the right reasons. You know, as the political, you know, 
kind of catch all answer, right? It's, you know, China's ruining our economy or China's influencing our social media through, you know, our politics, state sponsor, or, right? Or yeah. it's through state sponsored, you know, basically mm-hmm. got people that work for the government. They just basically sit on social media and post, you know, pro government messages in any outlet that, you know, lets it happen. So it's. But that's not so outlandish. I mean, that's actually right, happening. It's not. So it's. Yeah. yeah, I haven't really seen too much out really stuff. Yeah, it's mostly, you know, just growing up. It's really what I see in China. Like, again, I said it was more anti Japanese uh, propaganda where they would literally paint them as, you know, like demons and devils and things like that. Let me ask you this Does China make the best AK 47? <laughs> <laughs> this is the AK corner. Let's talk a little AK. That, that depends, I guess. Um, yeah, if you kill somebody, then half an hour later, you have to kill them again. Right. It's, <laughs> it's like um, with Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get hungry real quick. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that they did make the best AKs because a lot of it was, you know, just copied and, you know, they threw their own spin on it. But the, the one I am after right now is a tight 56S underfolder, you know, with the bay in that from Narenko, just because I have some family connection to it all. <laughs> so I guess... Your family connection? Um, so my grandfather uh, was the general manager uh, for Narenko's small mun- uh, munitions plant. No shit. And, and then he was moved up to uh, the general manager of the, uh, you know, a branch outside of Beijing. And so, you know, I got to see the, the better sides of communism i guess thanks to that and that's why i really want a numerical success that's a good reason definitely yeah so um on facebook um connor p norris and it's not a question he's just making a uh a statement here he said my favorite piece of completely made up uh agiprop uh, specifically atrocity propaganda was the story from the British early on in World War One of the German soldiers allegedly marching through conquered Belgium, tossing babies into the air and skewering them on their bayonets. Totally cartoonish fabrication. The British press just wanted to demonize the Germans so thoroughly to inflame the British public uh, to supporting the war. Well, they weren't far from that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's Mark. that's what all all sides did. The uh, American uh, posters I've seen that described uh, Germans as these uh, kind of half people, half apes, who were trying to crawl into America. So yeah, uh, that happened on all uh, on all sides and uh, everywhere. Um, regarding that uh, previous question, um, the ridiculous. Things I've seen a lot of ridiculous portrayals of Russians and Soviets in Hollywood, they were completely unrealistic and unreal. Uh, but that wasn't as much propaganda that doesn't qualify as propaganda, it was just a stupid, distorted, ignorant view. Fictional, um, shit. yeah, right. But that wasn't meant to kind of create the uh impression of uh, that would lead to hatred or antagonism, it was just stupidly ignorant view on that same line oleg there are a couple posters that i've seen um that basically tell people not to eat their children um that are in russian or cyrillic are those real or are those made up as far as you know and apparently it came from the ukraine famine or i might be messing this up but i think it had to do with people starving to death um, and that there was some cannibalism going on. That's the. Do you know of any of the fact or fiction about? Well, I never. I've never seen those. Uh, it sounds like somebody's uh, like gallows humor parody. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know there were cases of cannibalism during famines, but uh, the government would never make posters like that because uh, officially those famines didn't exist. So mm. the posters would be. You know, would be proof that fam- there is famine. Right, right. Thank you. So this is a question uh, from Instagram. It's from 
Uh, Bruner 1981 JPCE is for Oleg. Is there anything you've seen in modern American media that reminds you of old communist propaganda, which we've talked about a little bit? Is any of it notably concerning to you? How, if at all, were firearms, specifically the AK, portrayed in the communist media? Uh, I can answer the first part uh, about the uh, American media reminding the Soviet media. Um, it reminded me a little bit at the beginning when I just began to understand what was going on um, in the like early 2000s. Uh, but then in right now, during the Trump presidency, they became full on Soviet propaganda. Uh, and uh, in the Biden times, especially during the Obama times, too, you know, the, uh, all the glorious stories about how great uh, our dear leader Obama is. And uh, <laughs> that and then, you know. The media, though, the sides that they take, you know, you saw how they treated Obama, you see how they treat Biden and you saw how they treated Trump. Right. The difference is great. Uh, well, you know, Americans will soon have to learn to read uh, between the lines, just like the Soviets did, because we learned about what was happening from the rejections uh, in the media, not from what they were uh, stating. We needed to understand what was really going on by try reading between the lines. There is a good joke about reading between the lines, uh, like uh, there are six, six contradictions of uh, um, socialism in the USSR. You, you know, the, according to classical Marxism, there are no contradictions in socialism. There are only contradictions in capitalism. But uh, somebody pointed at six contradictions of socialism, and that is uh, that uh, there is no unemployment, and yet nobody's working. That's <laughs> one. And nobody's working, and yet all the production quotas are fulfilled. And then all the production quotas are fulfilled, and yet the stores are empty. The stores are empty, and yet everybody has everything at home. And that's because of the black market. And then everybody has everything at home, and yet everybody is unhappy. And everybody is unhappy, and yet everybody, the voting is always unanimous. Yeah. They will vote for the continuation of the system. And then, uh, so that's about reading between the lines. Um, so I thought at some point that there, it's time to create a, a similar joke about the contradictions of socialism in the United States, uh, because it's turning into a socialist country now. So it's like um, mm, uh, capitalism is uh, greedy and cruel, and yet half of the population is subsidized. Like America is a capitalist country, yet half of the population is subsidized. And then half of the population is subsidized, but they still think they're victims. And they think, think they're victim, they are victims, but their representatives run the government. Sounds and like America. Their representatives run the country, uh, and yet the poor keep getting poorer. And the poor keep getting poorer, and yet they have all the things that people in other countries can only dream about. And they have things that people in other countries can only dream about, and yet um, they want America to be like those other countries. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That, um, what about you, Bill? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what was it? So as far as um, uh, in the American media that reminds you maybe of the, the Chinese communist um, propaganda, anything concern, uh, notably concerning to you and what you're seeing here in America? I think right now it's just you're seeing you know, it's you're seeing this same line from multiple outlets, right? And they're all driving the same narrative. And even on some of the other side, the narrative is the same. So it seems like even so, it really does seem like they're controlling all information that's being you know disseminated to us. Even when people know things aren't true, the media will report it because. They'll have some big flashy headline that grabs your attention and will sway your opinion quickly, you know, without you reading it all. And it's just the opinions that's been pushed onto them by, you know, their 
editors or you know whoever else pays them right and yeah it just you know, it's like every channel you go to every show you go to it's almost the same and that's kind of a concerning thing and then um this is kind of part of his his question also where he was asking about how if at all were firearms specifically the ak betrayed in the communist media and you know here's one uh <laughs> this one here <laughs> oh it's, it's classic you know the original poster, right? Where the guy is actually offered a, a glass of vodka, and he says, "No, I'm I'm gonna be sober." Hmm. Yeah, that that is definitely a um, a remake of that one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, for us, it was you know it was always present, but never they never really pointed to it. You know, so just it was, kind of it more was, background kind of thing. It was kind of just subliminal. You know, maybe that's where my where my love of AKs really comes from, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's more of a power control thing too. Is like if you don't conform, look what we've got back here. You know, we've yep. got guns that we're going to control you with if you don't conform to our our will. Yeah, it, it's it's funny, you know. Right now, or at least a few years ago, when knife attacks were the prevalent thing in China, you know, for anyone to go to a supermarket to even purchase a kitchen knife, you'd have to show all your identification. They would log it in and everything just for a kitchen knife. So it's wow. like uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a registry for, for cooking utensil. Wow. What about uh, your post that you did, Brian? You got any questions on your post? You know, I got one here um, actually on, on the Talking Lead page on Instagram. Were there any agit prop books, music, et cetera, that you enjoyed? And, um, you know, I came across one maybe a couple, three, four weeks back. The San Francisco Gay Men's Choir put out a video that's been since taken down everywhere they can, but I'm sure there are copies around um that's called we are coming for your children and um it's this snarky disgusting horrible video where they don't you know they don't come right out and say what they're implying they say they're going to that that they're going to or we're we're converting we're going to convert your children and something like that and then they do kind of a dot 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 um to be tolerant loving human beings and then they're going to come for you and turn you into a tolerant human being and um i was immediately enraged as i saw the video but you know trying to practice sort of detached observation these days of what's going on and so i decided not to have a an opinion on it for a couple days to see how it sat and uh the um the thing that that struck me was how far it it screwed its way into my head like that the tune that you can't get out of your head and of course i you know my my end conclusion is that um yeah f that and um uh that that i have uh zero willingness to entertain a, a civil discussion with folks that are uh that are acting in that way um but do you guys I, i'm curious if if bill and oleg saw that video and what their thoughts on it are because it i think it was very well produced um as a as a tool of agitation no i actually haven't seen this well i'll try and dig up a link here while we're talking oleg did you happen to come across it no it was know. fairly swiftly um what was the word for it in in talking or in, in uh 1984 he was part of the ministry of uh of it three. Yeah, it was, minute through. Uh, it went down the memory hole. There it is. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah. While you're looking for that, what about you, Bill? You got any questions uh, on the post you made? Um, I think they went to your post on the Talking Lead page and on okay. Instagram and asked a few, maybe. We, we've got some questions for you, and we're going to save those for... Uh, our wrap up here because they're all about what you got going on with sure shot so all right we'll talk about that sounds good um, let's see austin whalen no questions just looking forward to this episode tandem dooley 
without the propaganda, would the AK be as recognized? With the Soviet influence in Asia and Africa, their propaganda was pushed more than any from the West. Who wants to take that one? I don't. I don't think the agit propaganda. Agit I, right. Propaganda. I don't think it was. I think it was just the manufacturing. How many manufacturing bases there were for you know the ease of manufacturing of it and and when it's con you know when it's communist I think control. Just its reputation the, in battle is yep. the and best propaganda it had. There's just so many out there, and they were just being sold for cents on the dollar to you know anyone that was willing to buy them for a certain period of time. So. Right. So is this the video, Brian? Brian, you're muted. Uh, sorry, it's a link to a story in the video uh, that's been on memory hold. And um, <laughs> the, the, the original video was something like four and a half minutes long. And um, yeah, it's, it's worth people looking at because of it, it's such a sterling example of what we're talking about today. Um, going well, it, on right now. Well, yeah, this is the uh, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus uh, outlining how they'll convert your children. Hit it. <laughs> yeah, I will share. I, I, I want to share this. this. Yeah, no, let me um, see if the audio comes through here. Oh, there's no audio. Uh, let, yeah, let me unshare and then reshare because this is a it's kind of a big one. Um, and then we're going to turn computer. Yeah, here we go. So to those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. You think we're sinful? You fight against our rights. You say we all lead lives you can't respect. But you're just frightened. You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked. Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly, and you will barely notice it. You can keep them from disco. Warn about San Francisco. I like this guy. Pants, we don't care. I mean, that's that's the it's it like goes on like that for four and a half minutes of pure rage, and obviously, I I hope it's obvious. I I don't right. think it's give a give one damn who people have sex with or who they love. It's it's this forced conformance that I think. Uh, no, I don't think there's any more or any less gayness in the world than there has been since the beginning of time it's just more you know it's more publicized now <clears throat> yeah. yeah propagandized yeah it's propaganda there you go add you prop <laughs> what is well, gay to me though? this sounds like uh, to me this sounds like a little bit ironic and sarcastic message that uh he's not he's uh, like uh, just pretending to be like uh, trying to be the devil's advocates, uh, showing, instead of saying, well, I, I mean, I haven't seen the whole thing, so it's hard to judge. But my first impression was that um, the the message was, come down, people, we're not going to be do that. This is like so outrageous that it's no no sane person would be saying those things. And and, and can all gay people sing? <laughs> I have nothing against gay people whatsoever, but it just seems like they can all sing really well. I uh, yeah. can, can confirm I know some really sloppy gay dudes. Uh, Tim, okay. uh, the, <laughs> Tim Dillon is I gay. have several gay friends, and they can all sing really well. I'm jealous. <laughs> um, all right. Um, we're going to wrap up our listener questions with this one. Uh, and this is M. Jolens Might. M. Jolin's mic. Was Rocky IV the most effective anti-Soviet propaganda piece ever made? <laughs> is it true that Rocky's speech at the end of the film is what 
single-handedly caused the Soviet Union to collapse? <laughs> or was it David Hasselhoff in a piano scarf straddling the Berlin Wall that pushed it over the edge? <laughs> yeah. Best question ever on this yeah. show. Speaking, speaking of Rocky, well, first of all, um, the propaganda has to be... Uh, the, the question about whether it was effective has to be answered by Americans who watched it at the time. Uh, uh -huh. We never, I never heard of Rocky until I came to America. Of course, those movies were not shown. Yeah. I had no idea they existed. Uh, but when I saw that Russian boxer, that looked a little bit ridiculous. Uh, what is his name? Lindgren, right? The, Dolph the, Lundgren. Lundgren, right, the Swedish guy. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, um, you see, the previous question was what uh, examples of uh, American prop anti-Soviet propaganda seemed ridiculous. That seemed ridiculous, but uh, that wasn't... See, the difference here is that the propaganda in the Soviet Union was all government-sponsored and government-controlled, and all the movies also were made by the government. You cannot not make movies outside of government. Uh, in America, it was all private business, so government did not tell Sylvester Stallone to make that movie. It was his own idea and, uh, you know, whatever, whoever created it, producers, uh, screenwriters, they were uh, all um, doing it on their own will um, without the, mm, looking at the government for approval or uh, censorship. Now, uh, during the war, the government did sponsor propagandistic movies, and I've seen some, um, the, including Second World War. Um, but that was, again, a justified uh, thing that disappeared after the war ended. And after that, the government didn't uh, participate in the arts. Now, um, an organization can create a propaganda. Uh, that's true, like some association. Uh, it's similar to uh, commercial advertising. Um, but What's happening today is that it's being um, this propaganda is being enforced by some kind of a invisible committee in Hollywood. It seems I don't know whether it exists or not, but it seems like all those producers are of the same mind: what goes and what doesn't. Um, and uh, also, I hear there is a, a lot of influence of the Chinese communists in Hollywood that are buying up studios and are telling the uh, producers what they can make and what they cannot make and that's why that uh, John Santa was uh, apologizing because he was told by producers apparently that if the new movie that was released the Suicide Squad is not if China uh, refuses to take that movie the studio will lose a lot of money and now the Chinese market is probably bigger than the American market. America stopped going to theaters, but the, in China, there are more and more moviegoers because, uh, again, the middle class is growing. People have more money to pay. Um, so more and more is oriented towards uh, China and other countries. And so the uh, Chinese Communist Party has more and more say in what Hollywood produces. And then uh, that, that way the propaganda can become um, really what it used to be in the Soviet Union, government-sponsored and controlled. Very good. So... Um, found too that uh, the White House is spending a ridiculous amount of money, I forget how much, hiring uh, TikTok influencers to um, make videos about getting vaccinated. And so I think, I think you can call that full-scale propaganda at this point. Yep. Uh, Benny Drama, I think is the guy's name. He did, it, and he's apparently wearing a dress as he does it, is talking with Jen Psaki about a day in the life of a Washington intern. And, you know, there's all kinds of, it, it's so funny uh, why that would appeal to the unvaccinated if that's who Democrats think the unvaccinated are is, is a question in its own right. Um, but right. dollars at work. That qualifies as uh, government propaganda already. And you notice how the government, in the Obama years, there was also uh, an effort to create government propaganda when the NEA, the National uh, Endowment for the Arts, 
announced uh, grants for the artists who would create best Obamacare promotions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that happened. During Trump years, that didn't happen. Uh, I mean, the, the government didn't engage in propaganda. Uh, what are we seeing now? What are we sharing this? What is, is this your TikTok thing you're talking about? That is Drama Cooper, the White House. In turn, TikTok video goes viral. All right. Okay, I see. I thought that was the continuation of that gay uh, video. <laughs> I think it's another gay thing. But anyway, uh, let's let's do some giveaways. Um, we're going to give away a Mission First Tactical AK Corner logoed dump tray or armorer's tray, as I like to use them as. Uh, for Mission First Tactical, you can go to missionfirsttactical.com and use the code LEADHEAD. You'll get 20% off. Uh, and you can buy one of these. You can buy their holsters. You can buy their uh, AR accessories. They got all kinds of cool stuff. Magazines. Uh, they do AR magazines. Yep, right here. You can do logo magazines. And I'm going to let... Uh, Bandito, are you on social media right now? The Instagram? Uh, I can be. Pick... Yep. Uh, um, Pick pick a winner there from Instagram or Facebook, and that's going to be the winner for the uh, dump tray. The commenters or? Yeah, the people who left comments. That's the only way uh, you, you got to participate. That's how we I pick mean, up everything. I think with Mailner's might, the comment about Rocky IV. The Rocky IV, yeah. I think that's really deserving of that, of that Definitely. tray. So... Um, what say his name again? Uh, it's the it's Mayoners Mayoners Might, M J O L N I R S M I G H T. There you go. Whoever you are, email me talkinglead at gmail .com. You are the winner of the Mission First Tactical AK Corner logo dump tray, uh, and put in the email what you won, and I'm gonna need your address also. Because a lot of people will contact me and not even send their address. How do you expect me to get you your prizes? Come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> All right. So the next prize we're giving away is a SEAL 1 um, package. It's a complete package of their CLP uh, cleaning products. I gave my one away that I normally show. My cable guy came the other day, and he was an AK fan. And he had a uh draco <laughs> in his work van <laughs> and nice. I, was, I was like you win a seal one package buddy that was awesome uh but yeah it'll come with the paste the liquid it doesn't come with the uh the aerosol uh spray but uh it's got uh, pre-soaked pads seal one.com use the code leadhead and you're going to get 25 percent off anything any of your purchases on seal one and this stuff smells really good, too. I love the smell of it. And I'm getting ready to clean a lot of my guns because I went shooting this past weekend trying out the uh, AccuFire Thermal and their new 1-8, to eight, which is on a rifle I got back there somewhere. We're going to talk about it off air. Um, but uh, Brian and, and the crew, pick a winner for the SEAL 1 package. Facebook awesome. or Instagram. Good. Don't take all day now. <laughs> Where's the mouse? You guys need to. I had I had a, a layup all queued up or an alley oop all set up for them, but they decided to be individuals and start looking around. Oh, I missed that part of this. Oh well, there are two really good ones, right? Come on, Austin, work at mouse. Right, go with Jesse Bedo four. Jesse Bedo, okay. There you go. Actually, I'm going to edit all that out. Pick a different winner because she's already won one of those. Oh. Pick one for Facebook. Um, C, Crazy Randy won. Was it? There you go. That'd be a good one, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Let's go with Crazy Randy won from Instagram. There you go. Crazy Randy won. He said, for Oleg, what is the most ridiculous piece of American propaganda you've ever seen regarding the former USSR? And you, you answered that one. So, Crazy... C crazy Randy one email me talking at gmail.com. Uh, you just want a seal one 
uh, cleaning kit. Uh, Brian, are you giving away any Occam Lube this this episode? Well, yeah. Okay. Well, let's do that. Let's uh, next winner. Uh, let's go back to. Uh, have you been to Facebook yet? Go to Facebook and pick one of our winners from Facebook. And Oleg, are you are you able to pull up Facebook and all that stuff? Right now, let's see. Uh... You know, Jonathan Gallup. Uh, had a bunch of really good questions that got covered, more or less. Um, yep. Yeah. So, I, yeah, let's, let's send Jonathan a. Uh, we can we're do gonna multiple. Let, we're going to let Oleg pick. Shut Oleg. up. <laughs> <laughs> Oleg's picking this winter. Yeah, you can just edit uh, that. Oh, yeah. I'm an editing genius. You know that. I, know. I, I don't see any messages. So if you go to my Facebook page, Oleg, Talking Lead. Uh -huh. Oh, Talking Lead, okay. Because I, I thought you tagged me, okay. No, oh, I, I didn't know how to tag you. I'm sorry. I tried. I should have emailed you. Actually, I did. I was like, is this you? No, that was a, that was somebody else. Never mind. My that bad. link there, Oleg, if you click on it, that should take you to... Uh, talking Lead? you want to get... Okay, I'm on it. I'm on it. And so you you'll see my post the there with the the agiprop stuff. It's inside the context of, of Skype. Okay. Right. Well, I I don't know. I see seven comments and uh, those should they're supposedly comments, right? Yep. Um, Underneath the comments, there's a Jonathan Gallup, there's a Jerry Black, there's a Connor P. Norris, there's a Brett Bedal, there's a Jerry Black again. Jerry Black was really getting on this. Brett Bedell says, what food do you miss the most? What American food do you like the best? Makes me hungry. <laughs> so who do you like there on Facebook, Oleg? Well, there is one question that uh, I could answer but that would take a long time and we're already winding up by from jerry black how much of the propaganda did you actually believe and uh, that's it's 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 hard it depends on where um what time of my life like when i was a little kid i believed all of it of course yeah. because i didn't see anything didn't know anything else then when i started growing up you know. i think he meant uh means when you were educated and you knew better. Well, educated, but not from the uh, government-run educational establishment. You know, <laughs> educated by life. Yeah. Critical thinking for yourself, which we right, promote right. this show. Um, so, yeah. Well, I like that question. What made you want to settle in the U.S. and in particular New York? Uh, well, because I like that country. Uh, because I wanted to, it had the freedom. It was basically the dream from for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I visited it at first and I loved it, but I still came back because I was hoping that Ukraine would uh, become independent and turn into another uh, Western country, like that life would be like in a, not just another European country. Uh, th those were my hopes, but that didn't happen because I didn't realize how much socialism corrupts people. Because after uh, 70 years of living under socialism, the country became so corrupt that no progress could be made uh, for a very long time, at least for uh, my generation and the generation of my children. So we have to wait. It's getting better. I visited it five years ago, and it's uh, um, it's a lot better than what I'm left but still yeah. it's it's not there yet so um i regret it when i came back from america and after a while when i realized what was really going on how uh the corruption the government corruption was still present so much that nobody could do any honest business around then i regretted that i didn't stay in america at the time so i made everything possible in order to to be able to go back and uh, I did. came on a tour. Was that question from Jerry Black? 
that was from Brad Beto. That question from he said, please compare and contrast Ukrainian people with U.S. citizens. Well, that's a very big question. I can't answer right now. Um, but you just read one from Jerry Black, right? So he's our winner. The the New York question. Yeah. No, so Jerry no, Black, no. you just won the Occam Lube. Um, has he has he have you sent him some Occam Lube before, Brian? Yeah, there's sort of two there. There's a, I think Oleg might be referring to the question that Brett Bedeau put forward or Bedow, but I'm. Um, see one. Uh, I just see Jerry's. It says you settled in New York, uh, in the South. Many consider New York, California, and a few other states as nearly communist states. Based on your experience, how does New York compare to actual communist state? What are the similarities and differences? So you're saying it was Brett Bedow's? If you go two links. Two comments down from that, at least how it's sorted on my page, you'll see one, uh, what made you want to settle in the U.S. and in particular New York. Please compare and contrast Ukrainian people with U.S. citizens. All right. Who are you picking, uh, Oleg? Who's the winner? Who's the winner of the Occam Lube? Um, I don't know. I kind of like uh, Jonathan Gallup here. Super excited for this episode. I love propaganda art. Excited to learn more about the Soviet side. What are some of the major Soviet themes? Uh, do they ever address the disparity between the ruling class and the working class? Who do you see more in uh, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, etc.? What okay. are some of the favorite digit prop memes currently? Uh, and then that's the rifle that picture of. Yeah. So Jonathan Gallup, he's our winner. Yeah. That's, that, that's the most elaborate question. Okay. The ones. I mean, there were more others, but you already. We had a lot of here. great questions. Yeah. So Johnny, Jonathan Gallup, giddy up. You are the winner for the Occam Lube. Talking at gmail.com. Tell me what you won. Shoot me an email. Uh, and uh, we'll have Brian. Or actually, we'll have Ginger Snap. Is that his, is that his name, Ginger Snap? Uh, you know, I think that's a great way to do it. I think that's his new name, Ginger Snap, but Ginger Magic 1775. Well, he wanted to, and we still might. I, I don't know if he has yet or not, but when I first came out with Occam Lube Red, he said, nah, 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 nah. nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> It's ginger magic. And uh, so I think we need to change the red flavor of Occam Lube to uh, ginger magic. Yeah. I think so. I like that. Just call it ginger snap. It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So all you winners, get in touch with me, tinyletgmail.com. Tell me what you won, and uh, we'll get that out to you. Uh, I'm going to give away a Leadhead Brigade patch also, and I'm not even going to announce who it is, but I'm just going to randomly pick somebody when we get off air and uh, you're going to get this patch. And when you get it, post it on uh, social media and say, I was the secret winner. So there you go. All right, let's, uh, let's let let's uh, Bill, Bandito Bill, uh, tell everybody where they can get in touch with you, talk about uh, Sure Shot and um, what all you guys got going on. There's, a, there's several questions about, you know, what you guys got new coming up and things like that. So... Hit us. Uh, you can find well myself. It's at bandito underscore bill on Instagram. Um, the company SureShot USA will be at SureShot underscore USA. And I think one of the questions was how you know SureShot USA got started. And you know we talk about social media and everything like that. It's I think I saw one of their products pop up back on uh, you know Instagram Explorer back in the day when that was still allowed. Um, uh, you know, absolutely loved it, but you know, they were in Russia, they weren't really shipping to the U.S. And it just happened that I was on a, a you know, I went to a training class with Center T and Sableworks, who was putting it on at the time, you know, he brought a few, you know, with him, or you know, Dima from Center T brought a few with him for Sableworks to sell this and that. Grab one from, you know, grab their Mark 1 rail system. Absolutely loved it. You know, did my fun Instagram stuff with it. And the owner of the company loved it. And, you know, we started talking and everything. And, you know, I love their product and wanted to, you know, have a bigger presence with it here in the U.S. market. 
but not just by you know importing foreign goods and reselling them here i actually wanted to you know in, you know set up shop over here you know hire americans you know use american materials and you know try to give that same level of product to our customers and i had a chance to uh, that uh, oh. did the the razor company he said i liked it so much i bought the company <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, no, nothing that grand. Um, I had a chance to, you know, expand our operations into a machine shop. And so it just seemed like the, you know, perfect timing for all of it to come together. And then as far as what we have coming, you know, right now we're manufacturing and shipping our Mark III free float system with a full integrated top rail. Um, the biggest things now is to adapt that system to other variants here in the U.S., you know, be it the, you know, milled patterned AKs or Yugo pattern and anything like that. And then afterwards, we're going to fill out our product line with our Mark 2.1, you know, type manufactured. Type 56? Is it? I said the Type 56, which, what's your Yeah, I, I need one of those. <laughs> so if anyone's got one for sale, you know, let me know. Talking about you, hit me up. We know, you know, we love to just fill out our product line with everything manufactured here in the U.S. You know, uh, localized to our market to account for all the variants and you know, the firearms we have here. And yeah, just trying to kind of become a. What's new your uh, sites? Where can they get you? Oh, the website is, bill on the uh, bandito underscore bill on Instagram. Yep. Sure and shot is sure shot underscore USA on Instagram, and the, the website is www uh sureshot-usa.com very good and i want to get you back on uh, another episode of the ak corner and we're actually going to talk ak's on mm -hmm. that i promise oh, I'll you. promise you <laughs> hey if you're, if you're willing to have me back I'll, i'm more than happy oh absolutely absolutely I, i'm we want to pick your brain i know our listeners want to pick your brain also absolutely i think that'd be a great time yeah that'd be that'd be awesome oleg talk about uh everything you've got going on your websites um products your books uh, well i invite everybody to visit the peoplescube.com uh, my main satirical website where they can also see the books and uh, enjoy the parodies the propaganda posters and uh, basically as you can see the tagline at the top is the america through the eyes of a former soviet propaganda artist edit prop artist the edit prop yep. is the word yeah. of the day so um it's a little bit distorted uh, on your end it's probably because you're blocking the ads <laughs> so yeah you can see the poor me magazine there and uh, uh you'll get a lot of laugh um and you know see my books at the very top uh, if you scroll to the top you will see that there is the shakedown socialism on the right and uh, on the right hand side sidebar and uh over here no a little down down oh screen. down here okay there it no, is no 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 uh scroll to the right here there yes. they are this is the hotel ussr and shake down socialism there it is hotel USSR. a story of a young man coming of age in a totalitarian state it's, is that uh, your work there with the chick with her armpit smelling? <laughs> armpit? Yes, that was a woman I wanted to marry at some point. Oh, I yeah? Made, made her portrait, yes. Uh, this book is illustrated with my art. It has a lot of it, and it's a story of how I tried to create an art, but, the, but eventually the government convinced that I was a non-artist, and so I had to quit. No better way to get a chick to get naked for you than to tell her you're going to paint her, right? Oh, actually, she was sleeping. She didn't know I was painting. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> it, it was already after we slept. <laughs> so, and the other, this part of it, Shake Down Socialism is uh, based on my experience of working in both systems in the Soviet Union and in the United States and uh, the comparison of the two systems, uh, plus some ideas about how um, the leftist uh, ideas of socialism are actually a perversion of uh, human nature and how for example greed uh, the left is always complaining about the greed but they are the greedy ones because they want to take our property and take it for themselves exactly. um, if the unions for example are 
complaining that somebody is not paying enough, then that means that they, it's their collective greed talking. They they need to take money from everybody from the entire country and put it in their own pockets. Um, you got a second and, edition of this? There's two editions? Uh, yes, well, the first edition was... Uh, mm, I changed the cover and I expanded it because it was still popular selling after six years still uh, people would buy it. And so I, yeah. I, there, I accumulated a lot more material to include in it. So I expanded that a little bit, and, um, put the joke about the contradictions of socialism at the front and, uh, and created a new cover. And they go here to get the books, or am, are they yes. on, on uh, Amazon? You can, you, can, you can see that it's on Amazon. You can get it as a, a paperback, as a uh, audio, the digital. Uh, no audio, no, but as a as an ebook and uh, both, uh, okay. and also. Um, you should get Brian to read it for you and do an audio version of it. Oh yeah, Brian has a very deep uh, professional voice. He's got a very commanding, so. commanding voice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you also have a Facebook page. Uh, they can go to the People's Cube uh, on Facebook. Right. And I'm I'm posting uh, the latest, the best, what is on the People's Cube because I have contributors. It's not just my side. It's more of a forum where a okay. lot of Americans are participating. It's like a role-playing game. People pretend to be these hardline communists from the old Stalinist Politburo, and uh, we discuss common uh, current events and what's happening in America uh, from the, the, that perspective. Um, we also have people from other countries, uh, from Germany, from Belgium. I have one guy who writes from Brussels, um, all in English. They're great parodies. Um, Brussels. I had two Brussels. I had two contributors from South Africa. Even. Say it again. <laughs> it's the it's the minute work song. Six foot four, a man from Brussels. Six foot four, full of muscles. Oh, oh, oh. A bitch <laughs> <butt sandwich. laughs> Come on, Oli. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, yet? <laughs> I'm a down foreigner. Come on. So, um, I and think it's a mark of Oleg's integrity and refinement that he has. Is that no what mind. it is? I'm trying to get some levity here, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm loosening him up a little bit. Me talking about my humorous uh, satirical website has become so boring, and uh, <laughs> we needed to bring bring some, you know. Light. I wanted you to show us your um, your light firearm. Enough, guys. <laughs> Can you show your firearm to everybody? This is always uh, well. I have two. Actually, I have two. One of them is uh, uh, the Red Rider. Red Rider, maybe good. Yes. And, <laughs> and uh, the second one is the yeah. one I brought from my trip five years ago. Uh, it's uh, this one, and it has it says for uh, service to the motherland. It's an inscription here. And uh, what you do is you. Uh, this is how you load it. Open the cork, <laughs> and you pour vodka, or you can just put it in your mouth. And... Just take a shot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, and there you close it again so that it doesn't uh, go bad. That it. that's another gun. All right, you found my website at bashiam.com. And it has my art gallery, and also on the same side you can look at my books. And these and, of Katia here are just amazing. Like, I, as I said, I didn't know, I knew you were a graphic designer, I didn't know you were a fine artist, and these are... Thank just, you. Thank this you. one here is, yeah, they're, they're staggeringly good, so I'd, I'd encourage people to check out atbashian.com. It's, it's staggering work. Go back up. Yeah. Actually, when I came back five years ago oh, and I f discovered a bunch of my old drawings and paintings in my mom's closet, uh, I took pictures and I brought them, kind of enhanced them, brought them to what I wanted them to be in on the computer, basically digitized them, uh, uh, formatted them for print, and every picture had a story behind it. So I was uh, commenting on, so I decided to create a website to put those pictures on. 
and I uh, started writing stories behind those pictures. And eventually, those stories um, scanned down became, a little bit. Became right? a narrative, and I decided that maybe right. I should write a book about that. And so I, I wrote a whole book, and I included these uh, pictures as illustrations. So the book is mostly made of uh, stories behind the pictures, but it also is a uh, continuous narrative of a story how I was trying to be an artist and the government. How did you get Jake Gillenthal, to... Gillenthal to pose for you? Say again? This one or this one? <laughs> that <laughs> second row on the far right, Jake yeah. Gillenthal. That's. Do you know who that is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? This guy is actually um, from the Caucasus. He's, uh, he was from Georgia, but he was in. Okay. I don't Looks know. Like Jake Gillian, Gillianthal from Brokeback Mountain. Right, right. <laughs> but his of uh, Ossetian. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> so your artwork is amazing, though. You do. The bearded, the bearded guy is actually ethnic German, because there used to be ethnic Germans in the in the Soviet Union uh, who immigrated just like the Mennonites came to America in the 18th or 19th century. The, the same thing happened. The, they, they were also coming to Russia and settled and had their villages. But then during the war with Germany, uh, Stalin resettled them all to Central Asia. And uh, so this guy was born in Central Asia. He was ethnic German, but uh, he, uh, he basically like was a... Hmm? That's not, isn't that That's happening now with already. South Africans uh, migrating to the same general region, um, fleeing, you know, South African farmers I've heard are, are being welcomed with land in, in somewhere in, in Russia. That would be good. <laughs> uh, Russia needs some experienced uh, good uh, So what's farmers. the name of this website, Oleg? At Bashian.com. At Bashian, that, that's his last name. It's A-T-B-A-S-H-I-A-N dot com. Right. Uh, and, and people can order these if they if they like them on your website. They can or no. Are these for sale? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. They can go. There is a kind of print-on-demand store, uh, online store called Redbubble. And I, yeah, Oleg's Art Gallery. And I... Uh, Oh, sell print. Set, set, set up those products for print so you can choose Very what nice. pictures you want and then you can uh, order them online. So, Leadheads, go and uh, support our guest. You go to Oleg's page here, check out his paintings. You can buy them, his books. Let them know how much you appreciate them being on the show. Go to Bill's, Bandito Bill's uh, website, SureShot. What's that website again, Bill? Uh, it's SureShot-USA.com. Dot com. Uh, check out what he's got going on. Also, Bandito Bill, you've got a website. Don't you uh, do some artwork yourself? Uh, right now, that website's just kind of laying dormant with uh, running SureShot and everything. Just haven't had time to I get you. any of the digital art stuff, sadly. Well, hit him up on his social meds. Let him know how much you appreciate him being on the show uh, and uh, how much you're excited about him coming back on another episode of the Talking Lead AK Corner. Uh, I W I U S. Uh, I know I've teased you guys. I don't know how many episodes now we're going to be giving away a Galil Ace. Uh, we're supposed to give it away at NRA. Time is a of the essence. I don't really have everything ironed out yet, so I don't know that it's going to happen. But we're still going to try. But if we don't give it away at NRA, we're going to give away uh, one of the I W I's Galil Aces at some point in time. So stay tuned. I'll give you details on that. Uh, sponsors of the AK Corner, IWI US, check them out. Uh, Jeremy's a great dude. He's been on a couple of times. We're going to get him back on. Uh, and then, of course, Factory 47 for all the AK Corner uh, T-shirts, leddy, um, ladies, I call them ladies, but they're tumblers that have the AK Corner logo on them. Um, hoodies, uh, all the AK Corner swag, you go to Factory 47. That's factory with a K, 47.com. And they've got some other cool AK lifestyle hats and uh, logos and things there. Uh, and then their new their new podcast, what is it? The Barbarians something? American Barbarians. American Barbarians, which I've been listening to and, and enjoying it. 
Uh, so go check out his new podcast. Uh, and then, of course, Mission First Tactical, SEAL 1, and Occam Defense Solutions. Brian, tell them what all you guys got going on. We got a new product about to drop, so stay tuned. It's really cool. You, If you go to our Instagram page, you will see a glowing orange barrel on a test gun. We pride ourselves on really t- beating stuff up so you don't have to. Um, let's see, cranking on the, we've got a, a second mill cranking, so we've tripled production here. It's a nice little Lamborghini fast kind of model. Um, yeah, lots of stuff in development. Lots of stuff on the horizon, and um, we're about to be able to restock the web store pretty mightily here. So, yeah, lots of, lots of action right now. Yeah, it's been- Occamdefense.com, check them out. Uh, social meds is uh, Occam Defense Solutions on the Instagrams and the Facebooks, I believe. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and then, of course, OccamLube.com. Use the code LEADHEAD. You're going to get 10% off. Uh, your purchase at Occam Lube. Uh, so go check them out. Support those that support this show so we can bring it to you each and every month, the Talking Lead AK Corner. Until next month, lead heads, get out there and be active with your AKs and bone up because you never know what we're going to talk about on this show. Mm-hmm.